Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today, we're coming at you on location from the home of Mr. Scott Seal. Scott, how are you doing, buddy? Good, man. I couldn't be any better, actually. Uh, it's good to have y'all. Dude, it's, it's good to be here, man. We appreciate you letting us crash your house. You're like, hey, you, you, do y'all have to bring some stuff in? I was like, we got a heap of stuff we got to bring in because now we're doing this video. Yeah, it's cool. And uh, we kind of commandeered your living room here, so yeah. appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you're always welcome. Jacob, how you doing? Oh, doing well. Super excited. Um, this is going to be a super fun podcast. Now, we, we got someone new joining us, Cody. Cody, uh, h- how do you know Scott, by the way? Uh, well, me and his daughter went to high school together. Um, and funny story, me and him, I guess, got closer than me and her. <laughs> 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 and now we, we hang out and fish and hunt and do all the good stuff together. Awesome. Awesome. His, his back door led to Mark's house. Yeah. yeah, yeah gr- <laughs> We're like, okay, Growing we got to keep up, this kid in check. Yeah, well, I guess I, I forgot about that growing up. Yeah. The way I met, I guess really how we got close was I met Mark, and we kind of, you know, butted heads, a young teenager that ran the land that was now become a house and this and that, ran around. So we kind of butted heads, and then now we're – all good friends and fish over there and that's how me and him got closer and here we are now uh no no, i'm super excited for this episode so this episode scott is something that you've kind of we've kind of beat around the bush a little bit on this topic uh the last couple times you've been on where you've mentioned because everything every time we've had you on it's been very much like rut rut related topics and one thing you mentioned to us in one of the last episodes we did with you it might have been the last one we did with you and nick uh, yeah. Back last December was the idea of you know you kind of said like your claim to fame's not even the rut hunting was the early season hunting specifically yeah. in Alabama bow hunting yeah yeah um th- just the uh, there's there's a lot here to talk about and I'm really excited because I think there's gonna be a lot of takeaways not only for me and Andrew uh, to kind of learn from you but a ton of the listeners because I think right off the bat when people think of early season bow hunting hunting feed trees stuff like that which we're gonna discuss on but they always think you know hunt evenings you only hunt evenings yeah. slip into a spot and hunt. And come to find out, that's not necessarily what you just do. And you, you've no, had no. you've well, had success. Uh, well, I mean, evenings are always going to have that last light moment. I mean, it's it's always going to shine. It, it, it'll always will um, when you're hunting acorns. Um, but the, you know, the late morning, midday, especially you know, a bachelor group that's been laying down for three or four hours. They decide they're gonna get up and and eat. You know, you gotta be there. Yeah, you gotta be there. That's yeah. that's that's the that's the thing. So you you can't, you know, uh, feed tree. You can't label it as one thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, now we we've got to discuss how you develop this skill set, especially sort of focusing on that mid morning. You know, into like maybe not necessarily early afternoon, but really mid to late morning time frame to killing deer. But before that. Before we really dive into that topic, when did you start focusing on early season? Because I think everybody, right when bow season opens, and in Alabama, it's always open, you know, kind of mid-October. And because of that, you know, you have a lot of pressure. A lot of guys want to get out those first few days of the season and just try to go kill a doe or something like that. Not many guys are thinking about shooting a buck early. I mean, right. very few guys I've right. met try to shoot a buck. They're like, I'm going to get my doe out of the way. And most guys, they hunt for a few days, hunt, you know, one weekend, and they're like, dude, I'm waiting until it cools off because it's hot as hell. I'm not dealing with this. When did you start – having success early season and then how did you kind of develop that into what you're doing now it it, it kind of goes back to you know when we we're talking about hunting the rut and 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 uh being more selective you know you have a two and a half three-year-old eight point come out show himself he's a decent buck you don't shoot and there and then you end up killing another bigger buck you know well that can also relate to early season there is times you know when there'll be a pot a pot of does and a bachelor group that are in the kind of the same area they're using the same things well the does and the fawns are going to come in there first they're always going to mm-hmm. and you got to decide whether you're hunting bucks or you're hunting meat you know and, and hey don't get me wrong i'm a, I'm a meat hunter i i i, I if I'm in a place where it's like I need meat, poof, it's, it's over, you know. But um, uh, if you get in a place and it's and it's pretty, there's a lot of good sign, it's pretty tore up, but then you start seeing where limbs are hooked and 
bushes or or broke off. Uh, they'll even they'll even paw you know they'll paw uh, which is a scrape pretty much you know but um, but I think they kind of do that when it's kind of like once once they split up per se uh, you'll start seeing you know a little place where it's like, I don't like that that guy gets on my nerve you know it's just it's just a reaction there'll be some buck sign in places mm-hmm. well if I start seeing buck sign in a place where I'm hunting a feed tree well I'm not shooting a doe until you know whenever you know so that being said that's 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 the difference in in the two i want to i want to set the stage a little a little bit more before we go deeper okay no i was gonna say before you do that by the way people this is on video now so people can see me and jacob arguing over that's what that's that's what i was gonna mention so guys if if you want to actually watch this podcast you can go to youtube right now and actually watch this because again this is a a video podcast now on uh so you can go watch this video right now i don't want to mention at the end of the podcast yeah 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 and and uh also i we need to figure out which episodes we had him on before and link those down below but scott scott's the killer of the wizard which is a buck that we hunted a couple years ago it's actually hanging right there and uh, I'll, I'll overlay a, a photo or whatever of that buck on the on the podcast feed because we couldn't get him in the frame. But Scott, can you explain the the kind of area that you're hunting, like what the habitat's like? Because it because it's not like open hardwoods, it's not big woods, it's like pines and SMZs. There's really not that many oaks. It, 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 it's it's it, 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 it's it's all SMZs now because so much has been taken away um, from from uh, uh, you know the timber industry. Uh, came in, you know, ten years ago, and there was there, there was massive, just massive uh, acorns, uh, hardwood, rolling hardwoods. That's now, you know, uh, pine plantation, and I know, you know, I, I can't argue with progress, um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty much all now SMZs. If you can get in some bigger ones, but you can have a man, you can have a a, a pocket just on a on a branch where there's some uh, uh, white oaks that are still left that are you know big as a basketball go. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're gonna you know there's gonna be times there might be somewhere there that's hot you know and and that's the key is is uh, getting in there and say, well, the Lord, there's a lot of acorns in here. Yep. But is there somewhere hot? And you, and, and, and you've got to be on that hot spot or tree, if you will. And it may be two trees. Um, but, but yeah, um, the SMZs now rule the day because of, uh, the fact that we, you know, we have lost so much, uh, um, rolling hardwoods. It's, it's, mm-hmm. And to caveat what you're saying, because me and Andrew are kind of going back and forth here, <laughs> an SMZ for listeners, and we talked about this term all the time on the podcast, is a streamside management zone, which is when they come through and log. And this is, I guess, more so something they do in the deep south. I've heard of guys in the like the Midwest and especially like the Northeast where they don't cut as heavily down to the SMZ. They kind of leave yeah. more in the tops. Mm-hmm. Um, but those SMZs is where they're leaving timber. And again, traditionally, like where we're at, it's a lot of hardwoods. And they're leaving that along these streams and these ditches, these drainages that they don't cut all the way down to the ditch. They leave this buffer. <clears throat> and that's where you're finding a lot of yeah. the feed trees, yeah. typically yeah. in this oh, kind yeah. of habitat. Yeah. Well, that's that's all that's left now. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I hate to say it. It's that's yeah. the SMZs. It's it's that's all that's left now that I, that I'm going to, you know, and and a lot of my uh, hot spots, hot trees, you know, last twenty twenty five years, you know, I used to have a circuit of trees that I would go start looking, you know, first of the season, and uh, uh, you know, it would just be like bounce, 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 bounce. Whoa, hold on. Now you you're seeing what you want to see. Now get the hell out mm-hmm. and, okay. and and get out, and then and then plan your hunt. You know, yeah, plan your hunt. Um, but now I I and I am I'm still learn. I, you know, I learn. I I found a place this year that was just like, whoa, this is going to be good. You know, and and it was it was a big sprawling uh, SMZ. Uh, thickets around older pine on one side the bucks are in there uh, I can't wait to get in there this year it's a commitment 
and I'll probably get y'all's young ass to come help me get one out <laughs> because it's going to take that. <laughs> oh, dude, give me a call. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. yeah. I mean, it's 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 yeah, it's 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 a lot, but you know, I'm I'm still getting it in my old age, so. I'm, and I may die on that hillside, but I'm cool with that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a good place to die. Yeah, man. That place, you know, me and you, well, I've been hunting the same place that you hunt. You've been hunting it longer than I've been alive, probably. I mean, I've been out there since I was a little kid. And when I was a little kid, there was still more upland hardwoods. But then as I got to be a teenager and I started to go out on my own yeah, a lot, yeah, I was like chasing those upland hardwoods <clears throat> as they were cutting them. And I mean, man, there was like a... a one or two pockets where there were still, you probably know exactly where they were, where they were still, you know, rolling hills of hardwoods. Mm -hmm. And I tried to hunt them and they got cut. I mean, like right as I, I must've been like 16. I, I always know. say that the damn loggers follow me. <laughs> I can go, in, I can go into, uh, you know, uh, kind of like what we was talking about on the, on the Creek yeah. earlier, you know, up in those rolling where it was just, uh, uh, Select cut pines mm -hmm. and, and the bucks were just man in a rut. Bo, you know, we didn't have we didn't have the gun days like we do now. They didn't kind of fall into place. It was like Christmas, you're bow hunting, you know. Yeah. And but those bucks were on their feet all through those those select mm. cut pines, you know. But yeah, you you, you know you adapt. But um, yeah, the, the the SMZs are that's you know that's kind of what we have now. So, yeah, you know, you can f fight that, or you just roll with it and, and make the it. make the best of you know make the best of what, what they what they're gonna give you. Yeah, I always struggled with the SMZs, man, because I never knew should I go to these bigger, wider ones. So you have like your main creek bottoms where it's it's your main creek <clears throat> where water's flowing through it, and it's gonna be your your much wider SMZ. Uh, it's gonna have more hardwoods in it. But then you have your, your little bitty tight ones that just go up into those pine thickets. So they cut the top of the hills. In pine country, they'll cut the top of the hill down to the military crest. The military crest, for the listeners, is where the hill rounds off and basically drops down to that creek. And so they'll cut to that very edge, and then where it gets steep is basically where those hardwoods start. And you'll have those tighter, smaller SMZs that run up the hillsides into those pine thickets. And I'm, I'm just wondering, do you find a better hunting in those real tight ones or the big wide ones or does it just just depend uh, <laughs> man he got that grin on his a, face pull a grin out of <laughs> uh, some of some of the best some of the juice, <laughs> just the juice. <laughs> yeah um they'll, they'll get on some on some on some tight stuff and the thing is and <laughs> <laughs> Go watch the video, guys, on YouTube. All right. Uh, the thing is, you know, you might have two or three white oaks right there mm -hmm. and in just a little craggy kind of area. Well, all of these acorns are rolling down the hill, down, and it will literally be just like a, a, a hog yard down there. I mean, it will be so – there, there, there is no denying what's going on. I mean, the sign is just, you know, and and and, and that's when I say – when when I see that, it's like, oop, bounce, get out of here, you know, and, uh, and, and you, okay. you figure out your tree. But but like I said, so many of, of, of the places where I, I frequent like that, you know, it's just like if they're there, it's like, okay, I know, you know, I know, you know I've got history there, so mm -hmm. it's easier for me to do that. But – um. But yeah, man. Um, some of those tight places are are they can. Uh, there's there's nothing that compares to them. No, I was gonna say Cody. <laughs> Cody Cody's leaning over. <laughs> that 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 takes me back. Why I told you I was turkey hunting, and I they were fresh clear cut. I mean, skitters and everything are still in there. We're turkey hunting, and I went from turkey hunting to next year's deer season. And when we were back in there, we jumped. Mm -hmm. There was probably 10 or 15 of them. And it, I mean, it started off where they cut on this side and this side. I mean, it's 20 yards wide. And then it branches out. And there's a creek that, f creek that flows through. But right there where it pinched down, where it started to open up, it, you couldn't walk through there. And there's not that many hardwoods right in there, but you got a few acorn trees. But just the deer sign through there crossing right there 
and the deer that were bedded down in there, we jumped some turkey hunting after they, I mean, they were cutting the day before. Mm-hmm. That whole creek bottom all the way around. Mm. It's it, a, you know, that's, that's, it's, that's a, tra- it's, it's a travel corridor well, you got, too. So, well, you there's know, three. It's compounding things yeah. there. But when those acorns roll off a hill and kind of pile up down in a little low spot, man, they just, just, ha- I mean, it's, it's so obvious. It's just, you know, it's, just, it's, um, so but, 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 but in the open, to go back to your point, um, in, in, in some of your bigger sprawling SMZs, <clears throat> flatter creeks, you got to look at every tree. You, you got to go to every white oak. You got to go to every red oak. You got, if there's water oaks in there, we don't have a whole lot of them. We have some. But you got to go to all of those trees and kind of evaluate, you know, have the deer been here? Um, were the deer here last year? What, what are, what, you know, what are, was there caps and, and stuff still left? Have the turkeys come in and rake, you know, just mm-hmm. the turkeys will usually come in last. Um, uh, the deer, when they're hammering them, you can, it, it almost kind of looks like, well, there's turkey scratching in here, but no, it's it's not. They'll, they'll, they'll kind of be, you know, raking and looking for them too. They'll you paw just, it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You're just, you, but you got to have, you got to have fresh tracks and you got to have fresh, uh, dung whatever you know poop whatever you want to call it um but then you know the droppings you can age them you know it's so that's kind of a part of the process as well um i don't hunt i don't hunt any place where i see where acorns are being eaten and there's no poop because that tells me they're not spending they're just passing through. Yeah, there's no amount of time spent there. So, you know, yeah. that that's kind of a, a key there too as well. Is there any consistency with what the understory of the SMZs look like? like? Are you finding cane down there or just any kind of understory that makes it a little bit thicker in that SMZ? Or can it just be like, you know, maybe it's only 40 yards wide, but it's wide open underneath and there's really no ground cover, but they're just in that spot? Or does there need to be ground cover? Mm-mm. No, it's 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 usually it's usually open there. I mean, you might have some green briar and stuff, some you know some browse uh, nearby. It's it's funny they'll, you know, even when they're under a feed tree, if there's browse, they'll nip at it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, as as a, as a as a whole, there's not any real indicator because it's mostly it's mostly open anyway. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, and. I, I'm, I'm gonna let you go. I promise. Uh, one of the <laughs> one of the reasons I was so interested in talking to you about this is like, first of all, we hunt the same place, so it's it's always fascinating to me to like hear how you do it because I've been out there for years now and I've never had success doing this. And the only people that we've talked to on the show with who have had success on feed trees are these big river bottom guys. They're hunting big. Did I steal your question? Stole it, <laughs> son of a <laughs> son of a gun. You're, it's it's the only the big it. river bottom guys, right? You know, it's the guys in Arkansas, some yeah. guys in Georgia, uh, maybe some guys in Mississippi and Louisiana. Big expanse of hardwoods. Yeah, huge expanses of hardwoods. Well, see, that's what we kind of used to have. So that's kind of what I. I mean, I I know y'all. Uh, delete some of the stuff but I, I mean i was i was hunting barber county that's where i learned to bow hunt you know i mean um and it is it was vast you know just uh, uh, and it's kind of what I, I got into up here mm-hmm. you know uh but that's going away now so so when i grew up with my dad when i was younger little when i ran the management with him there was more hardwoods than there was pines. It was all we're hunting. Yeah, so you know, big hardwoods and it's you know we're we're in a yeah we're in now, an adjustment. Ninety five percent of the stuff that my dad used to hunt, it's been clear cut and planted pines now, mm-hmm. or it's turned in to a, mm-hmm. and it's it's not there anymore. Regardless. <laughs> Too much, Cody. Too, Too much. much. We're bleeping that. Too Andrew, much. Andrew's gonna cut that out. <laughs> right. You got. If you're a public yeah. land hunter, you'll be way more secret, my man. The uh, no, the uh, 
So, this is the interesting thing about this conversation is, like thought, Andrew said. I thought we were talking facts. No. no, no there, there's some stuff. Depends you, on how specific there, you get with the facts. There, there's some stuff you leave out. So, uh, right. no, but you're good. That's, that's why we got to enter. So, I, uh, I, I didn't get the memo. Appreciate you, Ryan. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but that's the interesting thing about this conversation is, Scott, like, yeah, you were hunting this place back when there was more hardwoods, but now you're still, like, been having success when it's now mostly all ponds. You're hunting these SMZs, which is very different, like Andrew was mentioning, from a lot of our other guests who are hunting feed trees. Like, they're not doing what you're doing, and that's why I feel like this conversation could be so relative may, to a lot of us in the southeast that aren't hunting those big river bottom areas. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I, I say all this like I'm kind of complaining, but in a lot of ways it, it might have kind of make it a little bit easier you know <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I I hate to say that but I can I mean I can pull it up and be like, I need to go here and look but the thing is you've got to look at all of it yeah that's the thing you've got to, I mean there's there's no easy way there is not an easy way and it's an easy way for someone that doesn't understand you know they they take on deer hunting or they, whoa that's you know that's that's a massive. You know how do I process that? And I'm I'm intimidated by learning to deer hunt. Well, go into a hardwood drain and start looking at trees and start reading. Learn to be a woodsman. You know, uh, start there, and it just comes. That's how I learned to hunt. I learned to hunt by hunting oak trees. I mean. I, the, we hunted public land when I was a kid. We didn't. We didn't have. We we ran dogs. <laughs> I mean, we were dog hunting. That's how I started deer hunting. Mm -hmm. You know, and then from there, I was. I, I mean, I was obsessed with archery. I was obsessed with bow hunting. So, if you're a bow hunter, opening day of bow season is. If you're not hunting, uh, uh, acorns, on public land. You know, you might get one to walk out on a green field somewhere on public land. If it's planted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's worth a crap. If it's worth a crap. <laughs> well, again, kind of compounding, you mentioned it, it may have gotten easier since, or maybe not easier, but no, it's... It, it's it, <clears throat> it, it gives you direction. Compared to a huge mass of hardwoods. Yes, yes. And, and that's why I was going to ask you. So, I want to compare what it used to be like with a huge mass of uh you know, oaks or just huge right, hardwood areas right. versus now these skinny little SMZs and these creek bottoms. What were the deer doing in those big expanses of hardwoods? Is in like how did, were they bedding fairly close to some of these areas or were they traveling a decent bit compared to what they're doing they now in the ponds? They were traveling a lot more. They were. They were traveling um there was they were just on their feet more. They they kinda had to be. But it was almost like, you know, they're out feeding all night long, um, and all of a sudden they're like whoa, it's getting daylight, and the place that they want to go lay down is a half a mile away, you know, three-quarters of a mile away, whatever they may have covered. Well, you know, lo and behold, here they come. Blonk, blonk, blonk. They're just covering ground, trying to get back up there. You know, um, maybe after daylight, you know, um, hopefully. Um, I, I feel like they don't have to go as far to get to a thicket bedding area now as they used to. Oh, no. There's I thickets mean, there was, right there. I mean, so there were so many more hardwoods that were open, and now you have so many more thickets where they've clear cut. They don't have to go as far to travel to get food back to, you know, bedding area. Now, and that, Cody, is what I wanted to kind of get into, Scott, talking about. So back when it was larger, expensive hardwoods, it seemed like they were covering more ground. How did that change the hunting wise? Like hunting wise, how did that change when you started hunting more like these SMZs? As in, back then, were you still having success mid morning, or was it much more an afternoon sit compared oh, no, to like uh, what it was oh, now? Yeah, uh, uh, no, it was the same. Okay, it was the same. Their, their movement times and stuff like that. It didn't. It, that doesn't. That doesn't matter. Um, I, I think it, you know, kind of revolves into, uh, you know, they're they're going to be feeding all night. And it's going to get around close to daylight. And they're going to be like, well, we need to mosey on back and get in the bed, you know. Um, but then in about four hours, they're going to be like, oh, I'm kind of hungry. Especially if they're eating the crap out of some white oak acres. I mean, they're going to be like, you know, gorging. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they're like, 
I'm empty. I got. I gotta go. You know, it's it, 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 they're they're more driven. They're more driven during that time as well. To uh, they know what lies there. There's mm-hmm. like this isn't gonna last. We need this. So they're yeah. more they're more prone to uh, uh, get up and eat. Mm-hmm. You know. Man, there's a lot there that that I want to get into, but one thing I want to ask about before we kind of get past it is back when everything was these rolling expanses of hardwoods, mm-hmm. where would you find them wanting to go lay down? Where where were they wanting to bed before this was like all cut over pine thicket and it was it was more open expanses of hardwoods? They, um, I mean, bucks or does. Let's go with bucks. Okay. Bucks. Biggins. Bucks. Biggins. 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 Biggins are going to lay on a hill, on a, on a ridge, on a spine, if he, if he can. Um, and he's going to be laying just down from the end or one side. And as people would walk that well they're going to be like well i'm gonna walk down this ridge you know and 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 if and when you jump him i mean he's gone he's and you know he can lay there he can smell everything behind him he can look at whatever he can see in front of him that's what i that's what i know that's Mm -hmm. where i've always encountered uh the biggest bucks that i've jumped that's always where I've encountered uh, the biggest beds, if you will. Um, now, that uh, I, you know, that's just been my history. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I'm, you know, I only know so much. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what I've gathered. You know, th- um, this is super fascinating to me. So how? So they'll be there by. They'll be there kind of by themselves too. Yeah. Instead of like you find like four or five beds kind of in a circle, that, that's your no, does. I mean, no, I mean it, it, if it's a, a, a you know bachelor group, there'll be two, maybe three big beds, and and then they might not all be there together. They, mm-hmm. might, they might not be together at the moment. Um, you know, we talk about our bachelor groups when when I talk about trying to hunt them. Well, that's during the time when they're starting to split up. You know, so that's what brings those. Uh, those moments where they'll start pawing the ground because they, you know, they get the velvet off their horns there and they're hooking this and that. And then all of a sudden they, so, Oh, you know, that, that guy gets on my nerves, you know, it's, and he'll start pawing the ground. He's just like, Hey, I'll come kick your ass. If you come over here, you know, yeah. that, that, so there's a lot that there is a lot there. Yeah. You know? um, uh, I've always been told once the velvet comes off, it's re- They're ready to roll. The does yeah. aren't, but they are. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. And they'll, I mean, dis- and they'll disappear on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've learned that the, the past few years on s- some good ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, how has that changed since the same area you were hunting before has now been cut? It's a pine thicket now. Yeah. Briar yeah. patch. Yeah. So yeah. did the bedding change, or, they, or do they still bed in the same geographical, you know, on the same topological feature? <sighs> Or has it changed with the habitat? You know, Andrew, that that's uh, the pines in in some of these instances take over some of those geographical places. Yeah, um, they'll still get to where they can look in front of them and smell behind, and and it's bulletproof. I mean, you you know, it, you you can't you can't you're not going to walk in there and kill one. But um, but the thing is is thinking in my mind i'm thinking okay they're up there in that thicket oh right over in there i'm gonna come in from this way you know Mm -hmm. that's that's where the your own strategy kind of comes into play yeah uh the the smz's they come so tight now you know and and they can they can they can lay on the edge of it and where it drops into a hollow Mm -hmm. and man i mean they're money they can, they can watch that yeah. SMZ. Well, and, and if you come from the other side, they're either going to see you or there's no way to get to them from the back side. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it, if you've got a trail cut in there, the only thing you can do is cut a trail through the briars, through the pines, and have a trail where you can kind of slip in there without spooking them. It's, it's, it, it, that's when, that's when you get, that's when you get uh, kind of 
one-on-one with them and it's like can I get in there without blowing him or them out and you know yeah. can I get in there can I get situated and then let them do their thing mm-hmm. you know that's 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 it's that's the game that's 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 what it is can you be a ninja <laughs> yeah. I, get I've, in there I've jumped and ran a lot of deer out and I'm going once I get to where they were, I'm like, these deer watched me walk for oh, yeah. 100, 150 yards until I just got close enough that they took off. They watched me walk <laughs> the whole way in. They're like, is he coming over here? Yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Never knew they were there. And it's like, man, I thought I thought I was, you know, being stealthy. Yeah. But I I wanted to ask about that, too. <laughs> I know Jacob just about he, to burst he, over here. Say, he's, he's itching over there. <laughs> hey, I, I've been him. taking notes. Every time I pull my phone out, I've got some. Dude, I got, I got some. Stu- I've got some stuff you probably never even thought about. That's gonna be. <laughs> I can't wait for Scott to answer. But keep going. Okay, I I wanted to get into the betting thing because I'm always curious about how it seems like early season. Like sometimes they'll just lay, just about right under that tree that they're feeding under, mm-hmm. um, especially like right. Like if you're hunting in Georgia, we ran into this in Georgia over the years where they open early September, and I mean, Old dude, time. they'll lay right in yeah. the SMZ in the open, you yeah. know, and it's just like I don't know if you could even hunt that deer. I don't uh, know how. Um, well, it's it's hot, you know, it's early. They they're they're feeding there before daylight, and and, and this is my take on those Georgia deer. <clears throat> they uh, you know, they don't have to say well we need to get on back over here and, and lay down they'll just they'll just lay down right there and then they're laying there at daylight yeah but they're just laying there so you know they're cool too they're covered they're like you know everything is visual mm-hmm. see somebody coming we're out of here you know yeah and I, I want to get into the timing thing a little bit later. I'm so sorry. He, he's itching over there, I know. Man. Well, he's, I'm going to pitch itching. it to Jack. I want to get into the timing thing a little bit later because the buck I shot in Georgia last year in early season, I killed at like 9.30 Eastern time, so like 10.30 mm-hmm. or 8.30 our time, That's I guess. That's a great time. Yeah, and it was, time. it was midday, and he was coming back, and I jumped. I don't know if it's him, but it was a buck out of the same spot the afternoon prior, and he was bedded right there in that bottom like right there on the edge but he was like instead of 10 yards into the thicket he was 10 yards into the smz and i jumped him at like 3 30 in the afternoon he ran off and i went in there the next morning didn't see a deer until 9 30 and then he came up behind me again i don't know if it's the same deer and he was nothing right home about he was a, he was a two and a half year old you know little rack buck but i but even him even that deer was doing that you know he's not a big mature buck but even he was using that Where? same kind of thermal advantage or whatever. Right. Was was there a hot tree in there? There was there what I wouldn't it wasn't just like crazy, but this this bottom came up off of the river and it was choked with cane and it was where that cane kinda of headed out. And I couldn't find a feed tree. I walked through all that cane and I couldn't find a feed tree. And right at the tip of it there was two or three trees that were dropping, and there wasn't crazy sign under them, but there was a bunch of green stuff growing, and it was all browsed super, super hard, yeah, I mean, like you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. It was all browsed real hard, yeah. and there was a big mud patch, and there was tracks going back and forth across it. was it. hot. That was hot. So yeah. I hunted that. He's the only deer I saw. Shot him at 930. No, they, I've, I've had deer come in from downwind and be like, whoosh, 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 and then... You know, two hours later, they're circling around behind. They want to be there. That, that happened that morning. Yes, that happened yeah, that that's morning. What, that's what I'm saying. They, that's what they want. That's yeah. that's that's their little jam for the day. Yeah, and they'll die getting there. Yeah, you know. So As so be did. it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had a deer that morning. You know, two three hundred yards down beneath me that blew at me. It was in that cane thicket, yeah. and I was like, man, whatever. Yeah, you know, and. And then I don't know. It was probably an hour and a half later. There is he came there is, down. There is power in those hot bottoms. They want to be the, there. The, the, I mean, and, that, and that's why I, I talk about you know the acorns and, and the power that they have. They're they're driven to do things that they might not normally do, or they're more intense about doing the things that they do mm-hmm. during that time because they need that to get through freaking. January yeah. and February, you know. Mm-hmm. One thing I think that's interesting, you're talking about like the betting aspect, Scott, uh, compared to like what Andrew was seeing in Georgia. In Georgia, where we were at, 
especially where Andrew shot that deer, it was very gradual SMZs. Like they're mm-hmm. they're not steep. Like uh, there's not a huge elevation change from the bottom of the SMZ to like up in the pines. Versus like some of the stuff that you're hunting, it's probably a lot steeper. Where like if a deer is going to lay there, he's laying on a rock and he's laying literally like holding his feet out, probably to you know stay up or lay on the backside of the tree. So it's probably less likely, I would assume, in some of those steep SMZs to actually have him bedded down there versus maybe up in the edge of the pines or even just you know 10, 15 yards into those pines. You know, in the steeper stuff compared to like the real gradual right. bottoms right. that Andrew was hunting. Um, so that was just something I wanted to kind of bring up earlier on, but. Um, also, because I want to get into talking about sign and, and like the scouting aspect and how like you're able to put everything together, but when it comes to like these the the bash groups, how important? Because this is the topic I wanted to bring it with you for finding this sign and finding where the deer are at. How important or not important is running trail cameras when it comes to finding bash groups and, and hunting feed trees? <laughs> it, I mean, I, Jacob, I, I I came out of an era where we didn't rely on a trail cam. You know, so it's hard for me to have a, uh, you know, a, a legitimate statement about w- what it means, this and that, because, um, you know, I, I kind of told you before, uh, it seems like whenever I get pictures of a good buck, I get picture, I get one picture. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm able to, to catch him, you know, but I don't rely on that because of the fact um uh, um I, it's kind of like i rely I, I did i didn't learn from cameras mm-hmm. so um I, I i rely on um my you know the sign that i'm seeing which goes back to is there buck sign in here where they're feeding i don't need to know anything else at that point i'm just like okay what is the biggest buck in this bachelor group and and it might not you know it might be a six point you know so therefore it's like okay you know punch out go somewhere else you know so i don't know if that tells you any anything what, what you know but i i don't i can go put a camera on trees and i can get pictures of big bucks but I, you know i might get lucky and kill him i've all you know i'm I'm getting there, but well, what I wanted to bring up was because you and me talked about you don't rely on trail cameras, and that's no. where I was kind of getting no. at. There's a lot of guys early season that are so dead set on getting a pattern on a buck on a feed tree to go hunt him, versus you know, you know, your skill set is you're not relying on trail cameras, and that's why I wanted to kind of bring it with the listeners earlier on in the viewers. By the way, again, you can go watch this on YouTube, guys. Uh, the video version of this podcast is on YouTube, but. Um, you're not relying on all that photo data. You're just going out there, boots on the ground. You're finding the, you're finding the sign, which we're going to get to. You're finding the features. You're finding the buck sign, and you're you're figuring out how to hunt it in order to you know get opportunities at those deer, which kind of rolls over into the actual sign. When do you actually start walking SMZs to find the sign, and then what sign are you looking for based off the time that you're actually walking it? Um, September, mid September, when it you start to get some kind of fall days, you know, you feel like getting in the woods, just get out and look, you know, walk, um, seeing, seeing what's going on. You're, you're not going to see, you know, unless there's a storm or something come through, which is another thing. Uh, we're bringing it up. Oh, yeah. I wrote it down. Yeah. Get ready. Yeah. I wrote it, wrote it down. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen some of the most massive feeding on acorns after I a tropical storm. Up. I mean, a tr- you get a tropical storm come through and it's like whoa and it, but but that's on a camera you know i've got a camera out you know yeah. i'm I, I talk like i don't use cameras but i don't rely on cameras. absolutely yeah um especially for bucks mm-hmm. you know um because like i said a, a buck will come through and it, it just seems like i get a good picture of him and he's just like whoa i don't you know i don't like that um but yeah uh september once you know once the velvet starts coming off uh you know you can kind of get a feel if there's some acorns dropping if, if you know if, if they're if what's going on just kind of it's kind of like you're re, you're getting out there and just trying to get your 
finger on the pulse of what's going on. Yeah. And go from there, you know, go from there. So, and, and it give the listeners a, a, just a little bit more of an idea. You're talking about roughly about 30 days or so before season comes in. So season in yeah. Alabama, yeah. Uh, there's some parts that open October 1st. We're talking about October 15th here. So you're looking at roughly about a month out is when you're really starting to cover ground. Yeah. You're trying to find the, <clears throat> yeah. the, yeah, the buck that, sign. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, and it kind of revolves around the white oaks. The white oaks, Lord, sometimes they'll drop start dropping April or um, April, October 1st up until Thanksgiving, you know? So you're gauge, you're getting out, you're gauging things. What's going on here? You know, uh, some of those storms will blow some green acorns off and, you know, you, you'll, you'll be like, okay, well they're up there. You know, you take your binoculars, you're looking for trees that, that are loaded up, you know, it's not like you're going out there blindly looking at the ground. You got your binoculars. You, you're you're looking at tree. You're, it takes us back to you know, you're, you're studying the trees and what mm-hmm. the trees are telling you. It's <clears throat> it's not a um, you know, trying to figure out what the deer are doing. You're trying to figure out what the trees are doing because once they do their thing, then the deer are going to be there in some spots. Yeah. You know? So yeah. So. I, again, but starting scouting, you kind of do it starting in September, and you're looking for that time of year, potentially, like, when a storm comes through, blowing green anchors out, you're kind of looking at trees, focus Binoc- on that. Binoculars. Binoculars, yeah. and then yeah. also looking for any kind of sign you may find, tracks, mm-hmm. you know, any kind of whip rubs with mm-hmm. their shred in the velvet, whole nine yards. Now, what has to compound in order for you to figure out a successful place for you to go where you think you're going to have success opening day, and why is opening day one of your best opportunities or that first week to kill a big buck? They, uh, <clears throat> I've I've seen bachelor groups when they came in right at dark, you know, before dark, thirty minutes before dark, and it was like a uh, it, it 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 was like a bunch of teenage guys hanging out together. <laughs> just just, I mean. You hear this commotion, and it's just like, what the hell is that, you know? And lo and behold, here comes four bucks. And they're stepping on everything. They are, it is, it's, it's, it's just a calamity coming up through the woods. And you're just like, how can it, how can it be that way? And then lo and behold, there's one that's just a freaking giant. He stands in the back. And... and and, and, and that to me is their most vulnerable, vulnerable time. You know, that's the time when you can get an arrow in them. Uh, and then once that kind of subsides and, and they all kind of split up and do their thing, you're not killing that buck till the rut, you know? So, um, you know, I, that's to me. That's when they're most vulnerable, before they're spooked. That first couple of days, if, if not the first week or so of season, it can go two weeks depending <clears throat> on where, whatever property. Mm-hmm. And until they get spooked, yeah, they're like, oh, whoa, hold on, there's people out here. It's about to go down. You yeah, know? Mm-hmm. Um, say the- um, you know, but up until that time, it's just, I, it, it, it's laughable what they'll do. It's so- just like, how can this be? Y- y'all are making this much noise in the woods I- I- in an animal that just appears from nowhere. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's like that's their most vulnerable time. It's like it's like when you're 18 years old and every one of your friends that you get around, you can subtract like 10 points from your IQ. Yeah. Like yeah. you just get a little bit stupider yeah. with every yeah. friend that yeah. you get around. Say, yeah. some, some of the biggest deer I've seen been early bow season, and they come running in. It, it's, it's like a herd of does, but the the biggest one. He always kind of hangs back, but that bachelor group, they come in, and it's like they come in, and it, it's almost like a circus out there. They have no care for nothing, but it takes one. The wind changes just a little bit, and that biggest one, he'll be gone. The rest of them will still sit there and look around like, oh, you know, it's okay. We're fine. That biggest one, he'll be gone. I, I got a question on – Leading up to the season when you're trying to scout these places, maybe you start in September, you're finding the trees, you're looking up in them with binoculars, and you're seeing which ones have acorns. You're finding the green ones on the ground, and you're starting to build 
I guess your strategy for when October 15th mm-hmm. hits for here in Alabama. Are you scouting your access? Because to me, especially in this SMZ type stuff, it seems like your limiting factor is, is definitely going to be access and how you get there without spooking them. Because, yeah. th- I mean, most of the time they're bedded, what, within 100 yards? Yeah. Yeah, they're close. You know? They're close. Um, and what, you, what, what you'll end up doing is coming in through a pine thicket and – and mm. you got to cut your way through there and make you a trail. Um, that big buck that Nick uh-huh. killed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went in there and, and <laughs> cut a trail through there, and then he went back and opened it back up, and he, he killed that buck the next year. Okay. Um, but it was opening day of gun season. Mm-hmm. It, you know, like I said, it, it, it doesn't have to be – first of the season it's just like when did these deer get boogered up well he you know he killed it on opening day of gun season so a month later um but yeah you gotta that's you know that's when you were it's like okay this is this is my tree right now this is my area um i'm gonna come into here i'm gonna cut through clip cut you know it, it it's a it's a you know two or three hours afternoons work to get to where you just slip through the thicket, slip down in the bottom, and then, uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to use your climber or whatever, you don't, um, which I was telling Jake about, I, I, I sit on the ground a lot now, and it's, oh, that's, that's, that's fun. It uh, throws a whole nother factor in. That's intense, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great, man. It's, it's, uh, close encounters are, it, it's so exciting because, even if you're not successful, you're just like, wow, what a what a great experience. What a, what a great morning or what a great afternoon. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's what it's all about it, anyway. It's that We're, adrenaline factor when they oh, get that close. Oh, Lord, yeah, man. Mm. You hear them popping the acorns in their mouth and stuff oh, and, <laughs> and breathing. I've had them to where some of the coolest experiences I had is when they're like on the ground and you can hear them. They're like, <laughs> they're oh, yeah. doing that. They're oh, like smelling spit. them from under the leaves or whatever. Yeah, and or you something. can hear them when they spit them out. They're like, <laughs> No, <laughs> <laughs> you can hear them spitting them out. oh man it's, it's, it's the greatest else, isn't yeah. it? no talk about access I, I want to harp on this a little bit more and then I want to talk even more about the sign aspect um, and some other factors I got written down that I'm excited about um, so with the access why do you like to come through the pine thicket into a spot versus coming up an SMZ or like up the bottom um the percentage of them being in the pines already, you know, in the morning, it's it's lower. Um, you're going to get seen if you're walking in the SMZ. They're going to see you. Um, you can you can you can cut through the pines for a ways and then and then make a distance in the SMZ, but it needs to be daylight. Um, you know. Um, when you're you, in the you, SMZ, it needs to be yeah, daylight. yeah, yeah. You, you, you yeah, you, 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 you gotta be. A, you're almost, you, you're almost, you, you're hunting as you, you're still hunting as you go in. You know, that's that's kind of my thing. Um, and because if you go in there, you know, thirty minutes for daylight, hour for day, freaking two hours for day, it doesn't matter. If you're going in before daylight, you're gonna walk in there and the probability of them being where you're going to is is very high and you can blow them out and they will come back but uh, i i try try to go in as i can see i can look i can poke my way and i still blow deer out um but if i can get in there without blowing deer out the the probability of deer showing up it could be immediately is is, is right there now know? by what time are you wanting to get to your tree when you're using your climber because one thing we haven't mentioned we mentioned this a little bit but we're talking a lot about morning hunting and a lot of people think and we mentioned this early on a lot of people think early season you hunt afternoons you don't hunt mornings but again you've had a lot of success hunting the mornings but with that you're talking about like not going in in the dark you're gonna blow deer out easing your way in but at, how long after daylight do you want to be in that tree? Just, just where you can see good. Just okay. where I, I mean, you you need be you need to be able to see fifty yard. You know, I mean, 
you're slipping into these places. I mean, you're liable to kill a deer on the way in. You know, it's it's enough, that it's en- that uh, enough to walk in without a light and not fall. No, <laughs> no, you know, I I don't use a light. I never use a light. To my, you know, that may be my end, but. Um, <laughs> I've seen too many timber rattlesnakes. No, thank you. Dude. I don't give a damn. Um, <laughs> oh. But no, I I mean I it's just don't don't just focus focus. Mm-hmm. If you, once you come out of a uh, uh out of the pines, you hit a SMZ on a on a ridge or something, and say you're cutting down a little ways, you are just scanning and looking for movement, and then you slip your way in there. And get set up, and if you're able to do that, man, that's a success right there. All right, we got so many compounding questions with this with access. <laughs> Number one with this, how when are you cutting trails in and like trimming trails going through these pine thickets? Like when do you want to do that? And then you, I'm guessing you're not just doing it blindly into SMZs. Like you're going to want to know there's hot trees, but like how do you correlate? This it's worth me putting this effort in this year because I know these trees are going to be dropping. Like, how do you how do you go about like, you know, you could you could put in a hundred different trails and a hundred different SMZs if you wanted to, but you're talking about you know a month's worth of work if you're going to do that. How do you go about analyzing the highest odd spots for you to go do that if you're starting out doing this on another property? Um, you know, I mean, you could take that. I mean, you can make an easy trail. It doesn't have to be some you know, drawn out, well, I got to go work for, you know, for two hours to get through this pine thicket. You kind of have to figure out, you know, what, what, what how you want to, what you want to make of it as, as far as that goes. But you also need access. I, I just find that if I'm coming through a thicket, um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm liable to, you know, booger something up or jump something or whatever. But, Usually during the times that I'm coming through there, they're they're not there. They're not there yet. Um, and also, you know, deer bed in some weird places where some of these thickets. You're coming through this thicket, and you're like, oh, there'll be deer everywhere. Well, they're not. They're they're on the they're on the edges. They're on the outskirts. So that's why it takes me back to the the visual of you know, m- make sure you're you're not being being seen and and y'all looking at each other yeah (laughs) so so also with the trails you're cutting trails into certain spots a couple things with this number one how close do you want to have that trail coming out into that smz to the tree you want to climb and how does that how does that how does how do you figure that out like do you want to be right on top of the tree or do you want to be 50 yards off no, no there's no you know there's no rhyme or reason you you know, it depends on the, the trail you cut. You know, you got what you got once you do it. But the thing is, you want to get in there, get it done. It, it kind of takes me back to where I was telling you about when I get in these places and I'm just like, oh, Lord, I need to get the hell out of here. Well, that's when I start planting my trail and I cut on my way out. I don't, you know, I don't plan this as you know on uh, like e-scouting or whatever i'm in there i found this and i'm like holy crap i need to get the hell out of here just to keep from leaving scent all right at that point i have my clippers and everything i need and i clip my way out okay so that's how i come in now does it always win nope does it you know but it works you know I i mean you know there's something there. Now to compound on this even more so, when you're taking consideration of how you're coming out, do you take consideration of predominant winds you're going to be having on a hunt like that and how you want to cut your trail out? Uh, n- no, no, it's, it's, I mean, you're cutting through briars, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like there's less briars here than okay. there is here. You know? So you're not taking consideration. Like, hey, we're probably gonna have a southeast wind. No, no, no. I'm no, gonna no, okay. No, no, no. So that doesn't. No, because I won't. I, I mean, that's all of that's out the window. I've just I've got to get a I've got to get a trail where I can get in and out of here. All right. Now, will the wind 
that may dictate when I hunt it, you know. That that you know, that's a whole nother animal right there. Um which um but yeah, I mean you gotta get a trail coming out of there where you can get back in there. And that's that's how I, kinda how I do it. Now to compound on this even more so <laughs> What does this, we've talked about sign, but what is that oh crap sign that you're like, this is it, I got to cut a trail out. Like, describe to me, you get goosebumps. what does it look like in, in time of the year, typically you find that sign, like from the feed sign to the buck sign, like what does it look like that gets you super excited? Maybe give us an example of like one of the, the best stuff you found and also like some average stuff. Like what what is like, this is the oldest deer user, or okay, there's bachelor group here, the signs here, I've got to come and hunt this. Well, the thing is, um, you know, without going off of cameras, which I do some, some, which I, I, I mean, I have pictures of, you know, these, some of these bucks, but you've got buck sign. Um, you've got intense feeding, which is only going to come, you know, on into first of October. Um, all I need to see is that intense feeding sign a little bit of buck sign but then you got to go in there and it's like and 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 this goes back to the whole feed tree hunting scheme there's times when you have to go up there and sit and it's almost like an observation sit so you know you know what's you see what's coming in there no, you like it. like like I said like the bucks sometimes will come in there and then sometimes you know, there's a bachelor group that comes in, and and the biggest one's a six or a small eight. You know, there there's, it you can't put it in a in a in a nutshell. There's no way to. It, does that make sense? Would you, you, know? would you ever do an observation sit before season, like sit real far back and just see what, what's coming? I, up I, I think observation sit is probably one of the most beneficial things you can do. I do. I I I, I will. And I've, I've, you know, I, 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 I would live and die by that because it's giving you the information about a pattern. It's, 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 and that's why these deer are patternable in Alabama in that, in that early season, you know, hardwood, acorn hunt. They're more patternable than than any time during the year mm-hmm. because the rest of the time they got brows and they're just they'll you know just like we talked about before they're just a kind of a circuit where they're just you know hey honeysuckle green briar bra it's just that's what they that's what they have so yes to 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 uh, to your point um, observation sit can put you right on the damn throat of a damn st- <laughs> stud deer you know now for you to do that if you're gonna do an observation sit you, i'm guessing you're trying to get farther enough down the smz in order to no no okay. it, do, it doesn't matter okay. it can be it can be where you're thinking okay i'm i'm gonna bust his ass right here but you gotta be there mm-hmm. you you've gotta see what's gonna go down and they may be they may be on a tree 75 yards over here from you and they may come there the next day you know it's 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 you you can't put a label on 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 that stuff that's that's what i'm saying that that there's no you know there's no it's not really black and white when it comes to doing that stuff it's like you you got to get in there and and you got to kind of jive with it and 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 make your best effort observation hunt uh Especially, man, if you get in a big, wide SMZ and there's, you know, five white oaks that are dropping, well, probably your best, unless you can get in between all those and kind of swing a shot here and there, you know, maybe one of your uh, best bets is to slip in there and just sit and see what's happening, you know. Um, There is, you know, that's where the variables come in. Now, talk to me. I want you to talk to me about that that morning, mid to late morning movement. 
like th- this skill set is something that's again interesting. I really want to like talk more about this or, real quick before okay. we get into okay. that, just because we're we're still on the subject. I definitely want to yep. get into yep. that, yep. but the 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 really heavy kind of undeniable sign that you keep talking about. Mm-hmm. What exactly does that look like on the ground? Yep. Because like, does it look like turkey scratch? Because a lot of yeah, times I kinda, feel like kinda, I yeah. feel like I'm finding yeah. turkey scratch. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It, 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 they'll be. It'll look almost like turkey scratching, but then you'll start fight. But, but the, but the tracks, and you know, the, uh, the scat. You know, whatever. Where they're droppings, but you won't. You know, you have to watch because a lot of times the dropping, you, you, you've got to be able to time it too. That mm-hmm. they might have been there. You don't want to be um, where they were. You okay. want to be where they are. You know. You want to be. Th- 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 there's a lot there. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it, it's not as simple. But you know, you're looking for droppings. Okay. Well, can you age a dropping? Well, I can. You know. But can you know Joe Six Pack? Can he? Can you know? Uh, so there, there's a lot there. Um, but usually it looks like turkey scratching. If they roll down those hills, it's like a damn hog yard. I mean, there's nothing but tracks and mud, you know. Yeah. What about buck sign? Like rubs? The, do, buck, do sign, rubs? the buck sign, if, especially when they get down. See, when they get down in those little low draws, well, it's kind of damp down there anywhere. Well, bucks will notoriously rub along any wet place they will tear up along the edge of any creek any little drain the you will find more buck sign there that's kind of what we was talking about um um at the year ender mm-hmm. you know it was just like well, what do you think about buck sign i was like i don't pay any attention to it when when it's the rut i don't give a damn where the buck sign is you know but in the early season when they're down there dredging down in the little where the tadpoles is at they're gonna tear some damn orange bushes <laughs> <laughs> yeah buddy and so would that be would that be a place for a camera if you wanted to put a camera out yeah in those yeah lower yeah, spots? yeah early year you know yeah you know, early early season um but it's a shot you just gotta you know put them put them where you can i yeah. mean if you want pictures of them it's not, man. It well, it's it's so motivating to sit your ass there and not move when you got you know, a hundred and forty inch eight point yeah. that's that, that has walked through there. Mm-hmm. That will inspire you to to sit there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. So, you know. Yeah, I always wonder about the deer sign and, and specifically the scat because that was when we first started talking about feed trees, that was the thing that a lot of people wrote in about is like, well just like should I just sit over turkey scratch and uh that was something that I struggled with too because on the same place that we hunt there was it's probably two years ago there was a, a fellow that listens to the podcast who we know he actually helped me drag out a deer one time mm-hmm. uh and he knows who he is um <laughs> he uh he had a picture of I think a 10 point in this one area that we were both hunting and I was on the the edge of this big pine thicket where he was getting pictures of that buck we'd gotten pictures of some big bucks in there and there's a a little creek that runs in between these two pine cutovers uh one of them is is pretty grown up with pines the other one was kind of a more fresh cutover so it was more of a true cutover and in between them is little mountain mountain laurel choked drainage uh with with really steep rocky sides to it and i was walking one of those steep sides in between those two thickets and it was probably like october 15th or something like that and the dude the feed sign on the side of that really steep slope i mean it was like there was no leaves on it and there was scat that's, everywhere. That, no, that's 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 it. That, that's the juice. Yeah, and I didn't hunt it. I didn't hunt it. Man. You gotta do that. So oh, I you found gotta it. Do that. I found it, and I couldn't hunt it for like nine days. I was like, "Gosh, it's probably not gonna be hot anymore." This actually is another question I wanted to ask. That is actually probably one of the places where you're gonna get a shot at a big buck. Yeah. See, of course it is because I didn't hunt it. <laughs> that's yeah, how it goes yeah, to me, man. Yeah. Because that, that man, they will get in some of the places just like. Are you kidding me? Like, steep. are you kidding me? Like, real steep. Yes. And there was rubs yes. there and everything. Yeah. Well, so, that some bitch was walking. Yeah. It was just like a big old huh? wizard bug. They're, they're like, like they're like you, a goat. They'll climb a mountain, no problem. Yeah. Oh yeah. Something you can never think about going up. They'll two hops done it. 
That, that's one thing I was wondering about, too. So th- with that tree, I, I found that area, and I couldn't hunt it. Uh, it was like nine or ten days. I couldn't get back out there and, unless I took a day off work, and I was trying to save it for the rut. And uh, I was like, well, it's probably not going to be good after nine days. How long do these spots last after you find? See, them? that's 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 the thing. You is you gotta you you gotta stay on top of that. That takes me back to where you know not hunting where they were, but hunting where they are. So you know, it's it's more observation. You know, it's 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 time in a tree. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to be there. You got to be there to be able to make that kind of decision or make that kind of call. Yeah, and the, and the last thing I got before we do the the timing and like mid morning hunts and all that is, do you ever find them on like keying in on those really steep slopes? Especially again, the same place that me and you hunt. Do you find them keying in on those really steep slopes? Because nobody's, hunt, I mean, nobody's hunting those, right? I I, I, I don't. I, I, I yeah, I find them walking it, mm-hmm. but not um, not. I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily feeding okay what i don't know what you know whether we're talking Mm -hmm. about feeding or traveling yeah um but the but yeah the the travel and 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 it just so happens they are there that i mean they kind of coincide yeah this happened to be on a bluff gap too yeah there happened to be a bluff gap and a drainage coming out of one of those thickets that went right basically through that bluff gap and that feed sign was right there where it dropped off yeah see that's just that's just those acorns yeah. Falling down. I'm telling you, man, when you get those acorns, when they're kind of congregating in almost like a trough, it is a feed trough. Mm-hmm. It, it is. Yeah. And that's what Warren Womack talked about too, right? He, he Like finding where acorns like all washed. He's hunting river bottoms, but he, he talked about the same thing in yeah. flatland. Yeah. Find them where they wash up into yeah. a certain spot. Oh, I can see that being a thing in flatland and because like that's, that's what, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so what would you have? Well, no, no, to kind of go off what y'all were saying, um, Scott, what if you can think back to some of these feed trees you've hunted, what is the longest you've seen a feed tree hot for, like, in the past? Like, as in, like, you found the sign, you went to hunt it, how long have you seen one of those trees being oh, hot man, for? The, the, that that the, bachelor group's going to use. Yeah, they'll, um, they'll do 10 days, two weeks. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's the cycle of the tree, mm-hmm. and it's a cycle of – did you booger them up? You know, did you, did you bump them? How many times have you bumped them? What, you know, what, but, but then it takes me back to, they're going to, you know, they're going to move around. There's going to be other trees that are cycling in. They're going to be there somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 you know, it's it's not rocket science. It, it, it's, but it, you key in on that, that one spot. Now, but how does that, how does this play a factor as in, you know, you, my tree might be hot for 10 to 14 days, maybe. How does that take into f- your factor uh, or the consideration of scouting by not bumping deer, but keeping tabs on some of this of knowing when you're going to go hunt it? Like, cause that's something that's kind of coming back to mind. Like, say you find a spot, this should be good. How many, I mean, and I know every situation is different, but like, are you worried about going and checking a spot two or three times in a certain time frame to see when it's going to c- get hot? Or is it one of those you find it and you kind of wait when it should be dropping and then you go in? No. Um, usually when I find it, it's hot. So, you know, that 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 takes me back to like, okay, get the hell out of here. You know, and then when can you hunt? Get in there. Mm-hmm. Um, now, generally, your first hunt... Um, will be the best um it might not tell you everything but then you know within a couple of days you know you, you either kill there or you don't you can come back but you got to gauge it you know if you go back in and you sit then you got to go look you got to you got to it's kind of like you know you got to know the pulse of what's going on there mm-hmm. okay well are they over here now you know so that's a you know, that's the way I deal with it. There's yeah. no, there's not really an answer to that. Mm-hmm. Generally, when I find it and it's hot, it is hot, and you need to be your ass in that tree tomorrow morning. You know, if it's season, 
if it's season. That's yeah. the thing because yeah. you may yeah. find it before yeah. season. Yeah, yeah. But now, if you let me ask, but you, you generally don't with white oaks. I mean, white oaks around here don't drop that early. Yeah, I mean, you know, open opening day. You know, October fifteenth. If you're finding white oaks, it's like, oh lord, yeah, let's go. You know. <laughs> But it'll drag on for, you know, two or three weeks. Like I said, I've, I've, I've seen it go on until, you know, to Thanksgiving. And uh, some of, you know, some of the, hell, some of the best, the later it goes, it seems like. Because you get some of those leaves off the tree. You can see a little better. You know, it's just like, mm, mm, I love it. It, 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 it. There's not a, uh, you know, there's not a book that's, that's this is the way it goes there's always variables you know now before we start talking about the more like the early morning tactic per se um i, I want to ask you something you mentioned this earlier this is a note i took down early on in the conversation is if we have a big thunderstorm that rolls in or a tropical storm or something like that during season that first couple of days of season that first week of season you mentioned, you know, you mentioned earlier that you've seen some crazy high feed sign after that. You, if, you, if you know that's coming, what is going through your mind? If it's shooting light, get in the tree because there is going to be massive deer movement. They're going to come in. They're going to get those acorns. Those acorns are going to blow off. I mean, you got oaks just. Whoosh, I mean, and, and all. Almost all of the acorns are fixing to come down, and it is a massive feed. You know that that, that takes me back to, you know, the whole acorn drop. It's 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 vital to their survival. You know that that's the one chance they get that they can just mass up fat. You know, just pack on fat and and survive. Which they don't have to worry about it here. But up north, those damn deer will die if they don't do that. You know mm-hmm. that—that's what I'm talking about. It, it, it's 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 uh, a something that's primal to them. When when those when those trees dump all those acorns, they're in there feeding. Now, do you see that also being a struggle? As in, if a storm comes through and blows out, because what we're talking about for listeners and viewers is that storm comes through, blows out all these acorns out of the trees, and we we've I've seen it before. We're like before a storm. You know, it's kind of spotty after the storm. You go out and you're just trip and fall and skid across a bunch of acorns. Um, that, so so that being said, is it ever an issue that there's so much food on the ground that they're not just necessarily hitting that one or two trees? And is that ever a consideration? Or is it, if you're in the right spot and that batch of groups using it, they're going to be there. That's when you got to go back to your, um, back to your scouting, back to what was hot. There's a, a weird a, there's a a weird thing about you know some some acorns they don't eat you know that's why the turkeys come in and mop them up uh I I you know I don't there's no rhyme or reason to when you get into a big bottom and the, and one of these trees just gets hammered mm-hmm. and the rest of them they'll lay there and and I, I don't understand that other than the soil mm-hmm. um. But but yeah, that there's that. Now is that an advantage though of hunting these tight bottoms, these tight SMZs that there's not that many options for those deer to go feed at? Because if you're if you're hunting a big creek bottom or even a river bottom, there's it's 150 yards, 200 yards wide, and there's oaks everywhere. There's gonna be food everywhere for them. But if you're in these tight SMZs up next to that bedding. It's not like there's going to be 500 or 100 oaks up there. There may be five here, maybe further down the the, the drainage from me, a couple hundred yards, is five right. or six more. Yeah. Is I guess in that situation, it's almost like a benefit for you because you're so tight to the bedding. There's not all these different options for him. And if a deer comes out in that SMZ and feeds, he's probably going to be within bow range potentially of yeah. you yeah. compared yeah. if you were in a huge bottom and hunting the similar situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like those spots. Now, tight. Yeah, tight, very tight bottom. The shoe box. The shoe box. Ah, is that ah. is that how you came with? It? Ah, ah. <laughs> okay, all right. The shoe box for for so, yeah, for the listeners. That's a place we mentioned in one of the last episodes with you. Yeah. So if you didn't hear that, you need to go listen to that episode, which I'll yeah. have linked it, uh, in the show. The yeah, first, their first one we had them on is uh, four twenty eight. I just looked that one up. I didn't look ah. year in, year uh-huh. in. Yeah, it's episode. hard. It's hard, man. You know, when you when you get in those places like that uh, with Nick and stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And I told him, I was just like, I, I, I can't do it anymore. I can't. Dude, you're looking into a shoebox. You are just just looking into a minnow bucket. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, you know, but that minnow bucket can produce a, you know, world, world-class world whitetail. So. And, and with that, I, I want you to tell a story, and then I want to get into talking like the early morning hunting tactics or the mid-morning tactics. Oh, the story of the biggest buck you've ever like. I don't, is it the biggest buck you've ever seen? The one, the one that you shot with the bow, or is that? No, no, that that the uh, biggest one I ever stuck. I stuck. Stuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, then I seen the the year before the I saw the biggest buck I ever seen. I killed. There was three of them. Um, there was a uh, well. It was that six point right up there in the middle of that stuff. Mm-hmm. There was that one, and there was another little eight point, and then there was a, a I don't even know what he was. I mean, I didn't have uh, binoculars. He was just like complete freak, non typical. So I saw him the year before, and then I stuck one the next year on opening day. Mm-hmm. That was uh, he was a non typical too. Um, and he he got away. Walk us walk us through that hunt and like what led up to the scouting for that hunt and then the actual hunt itself. <clears throat> I actually had a uh, I actually had a a buddy that was on a uh, a web page that I used to go to. It was Al Deer um, and uh, Shaw. He was like the bow guy. He was the bow guru um, and he was. Asking me, he's just like, you, just, you know, we, we just talk. Whether it, it was before, you know, really kind of any kind of internet stuff as far as video internet. Um, and I said, yeah, man, you come up hunt with me, whatever. And I said, I'm, I'm gonna go look. And I said, I said, if if I find some buck sign, I'm gonna hunt it. But if not, you can come up. You just gonna, you know, shoot a just bow hunting. You're shooting a deer, whatever. Um, so lo and behold i get out there and uh there was a couple of white oaks that were dropping but there was a damn uh chink pin oh just old uh i guess there's slang for all kind of mountain oak whatever yep. chink yep. pin yep um drop them big old yeah, round look like down <laughs> yeah. yeah well lo and behold these deer are eating the shit out of it. And, and, and it was on one of those drops. It was on one of those. Steep faces. Yeah. Yep. And they were down at the bottom. And I was just like, ah. And I got up looking along the edge. And there was some scrapes up there. And I was just like, I was just like hey, uh, Shaw, I found this. Uh, come on up. But I'm going to hunt it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in there and hunted. And, uh. You know, I saw a couple of deer off in the distance, but then at like 1030, somebody come down a road. They were doing something or another up there, just being, you know, whatever. Um, and these deer come running off the hill from up there where they were bedding. Hmm. And they come off and there was, there was a, there was a really nice eight point and, uh, and this other buck and they came off in the bottom and they were probably about 45 yards from me and there was times when i was just like man i could make that shot i could make that shot i i I had i I had my uh it was my older but i didn't have my matthews in um i had one pin on my sight you know uh i was like i could make that shot and i was like no 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 well the whole time they're just like watching where this noise was back where these guys were parked and I, I was like, and then finally they started making their way towards me, and uh, they came on up through there, and I don't know why I was just so just just brain fart. It was just like I never could get past the fact that they were further than what they were. You know, I I didn't have a range finder. I had my one pin. So the eight point, he comes on up to my left. And passes at about fifteen twenty yards, and I let him come. And then, and then the big buck comes up behind him, and I'm just like, "Oh yeah, baby, come, come on, come on, come on." And uh, he was uh, his 
his left side real similar like to the uh the the wizard. wizard yeah real similar uh tines of 12 13 inches long but he had five he had five on the left and then on his right he had two two his beams come up and then they split and then there was like just a bunch of junk around the main beams and then the main but there was like two main beams that come out and I, I, I mean, I, I was just like, okay, I got this, got this, drew back. And I held just a little bit high. I thought he was, you know, 35 or so. Held a little bit high. Just, and it was just like a laser. I, I will never forget it. It was just like a laser <laughs> shot. I mean, it hit him exactly where I was holding, you know. And, uh, you know, I never recovered him. Uh, you backstrap him, I guess? <sighs> Uh, probably, I, I mean, it didn't look like it. It looked like it went, you know, under the spine. But, mm. uh, you know, but uh, I look for him for the next two weeks. Um, okay. and, the, and the next day, <laughs> <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> the next day, the, the next day I was out there about 500 yards from there. Mark was with me and uh, – I come off this hill, and there was a deer trail, and I saw this big old just splayed out buck track. And I thought, damn, well, well, then I looked just down the trail on a tree, and it was just splatter with blood. And I'm like, oh, my God, this sucker's going to be right down here in the creek, you know. And it just, I was just, I was elated. There was hope, you know. <laughs> and, uh, no, we looked and looked and looked. We never, hmm. we never found him. Damn, he was just uh you know but that other buck i saw the year before was i don't even have any idea of what like as far as uh uh, um what something like that would score i mean there was points everywhere there was tines everywhere it was i don't even know how to describe it you know it was just like whoa but That deer come up and fed on a white oak for about 20 minutes and was just quartering to me for 20 minutes or so. And I was just like, I'd shoot that deer. I'm going to shoot one. Of the-. It was opening day of bow season. I was like, I want to shoot a deer, you know. And it just stood there and stood there. And finally it turned and started walking back down the hill. And I was like, well, if it gets in that opening and it gets an angle, I'm going to shoot it about 30 yards. So it comes and walks back down that hill on a trail. I draw back, just downhill shooting. Steps in the open, boom, just whack. Goes out this way. Well, that big buck was right behind him and had been over here. And when he started moving and milling around, he started following. I mean, it's just like, Never yeah. saw him. So – and when you say the big buck, you're talking about the the big non typical freaking ass. So, so yeah. that, well, that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier uh, in the podcast about like not shooting that first buck that comes out, especially early season, and kind of analyzing the situation. Not maybe be hyper focused on that one deer, but watch your surroundings and looking oh, for no, other you, bucks. You, you, yeah, you, you've got. I mean, that's me not knowing where that deer was cost me that deer. I made a perfect shot on Junior. When, <laughs> when this is like buck of a lifetime i mean i don't even know how to describe what this buck was you know that that you know that, that i don't even know how to describe it more than that i don't even I, I, it was just and uh mark ran into somebody on the other side of the river and he was talking to him, and he said, I know this guy that saw this deer, and he couldn't exactly describe what he was talking about. And I was, he was just like, what do you mean? He's just like, well, he said it had all this stuff going everywhere, and it was about a mile from there. But that was before I shot him, or before I shot that, the, mm-hmm. uh, that inc- you know, that moment. Yeah, but. Now, I want to well, go back to the, the, the deer that you wounded. Or the, you might have killed him. You, don't, you just didn't find him. Uh, the double main beam buck. What time in the morning did you shoot that deer? 
I saw him at 10.30, and I shot him at 11.15. How hot was it that day? Oh, wow. Uh, 65. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. You know, it was warmed up. It was opening day. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, that 10.30. That's the time. And you shot him at 11.15? No, I I watched him for 45 minutes. No, I was over. There wasn't no, like, oh, no, he's got the jitters. (laughs) No, there wasn't no jitters. It was all business, you know. (laughs) I mean, you know, and I I messed up. I I messed up. Anything I've learned, 10 to 2 from him. That's when you need to be in the woods. 10 to 2. I've heard that. We've heard that from so many people on this show. It, but it's always in a rut context. Yep. It's always people talking about rut hunting. You need to be it, in there 10 to it, 2. It's not just a rut. But mm-hmm. early season, mm-hmm. that same thing holds true early is what you're saying. So, oh, no. Uh, uh, well, I mean, 10 o'clock on a, on an acorn tree, if you didn't bust them out of there, you're fixing you're to fixing to go down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, like, t- two years ago, I killed the biggest buck I've ever I've ever shot. I had him on camera from when first in velvet when he had nothing but knots on his head, all through velvet, had him through bow season on camera. The probably the only deer that I've ever patterned like I knew exactly where he was gonna be by the minute. Like Every other big deer I've had on camera is like, okay, he's there, he's gone, he's there, he's gone. That one, three times a day, he was going to be in there at daylight, middle of the day, afternoon. And it was month, three months, of, I mean, span, it was clockwork. He was in there. It 10 o'clock, that deer was in there. He was not in there before 10 o'clock. From 10... He would show up at 10, he would stay in there for about 20 minutes, leave. 12 o'clock, he's back in there. And milk from 10 to 2, that deer was in there. Daylight till 10, you may get a picture of him walking in the background. Other than that, he wasn't in there. Well, Scott, and kind of going off what Cody was saying, you know, you've mentioned this a whole bunch about like this, that mid to late morning movement, even early season, when when 94. 95- Nine percent of probably our listeners are like, yeah, I'm not hunting in the morning. Everybody, you read all these magazines, all the TV shows, like, man, you don't hunt, you know, even podcasts, man, you don't hunt mornings, early season. You hunt afternoons, you hunt evenings. But on the flip side, what you're saying makes perfect sense is in, you know, they're feeding all night long. They're feeding up until probably daylight. They're going to go back to bed. And within four hours, they're eating high carbs. I mean, acorns yeah. are high carbs. So they're yeah. eating high carbs. So they're going to digest it. And they're going to be up feeding in like four hours. Yeah. And they're going to come back out. And, and this kind of yeah. goes back to the advantage, it seems, of hunting these SMZs specifically. Not these just huge hardwood stands, even though you've had success there too. But these SMZs where they can bed so tight to it where they don't have to walk half a mile to go feed. It's within no. 100 to 150 yards no, of where they're, they're bedded. They're close. They're so close. And that's, that's, what, that's why, you know, talking about getting in and getting out without without – busting them you know without boogering them up um and that's why i go back to like when i see the sign it's like oh get out get out you know um um so yeah i mean it's it's it they're right there they're right there close so so early well cody what you got uh, i was in the past few years i i mean i would almost rather hunt from eight to three then go in at daylight and hunt, and then come out and go back in the afternoon. I've seen more big deer, more big deer movement in that time than I have at daylight and dark. Yep, that reminds me of a spot, again, same place, and that same listener who I mentioned earlier, uh, old Johnny. There's a there's a buck called oh, Caribou Lou oh, that we had in this one spot. Big, I mean, crazy buck not, that he ended up killing. Yeah, non typical. But the spot I had him in, right next to a road, real tight SMZ, mm-hmm. twenty yards wide, thick underneath, right next to a road. And I had a camera in there. There was a big red oak. It was like one of the only oaks in there. It was so thin that there was barely even you know an SMZ there. Big red oak. I went in there before season, looked up in it, saw acorns, put a camera on it, made a little mock scrape. 
and I left it for till like December from like August to December. I left that camera. And when I went in there and pulled that card, the, all the big rack bucks that I had, all of them were like 11 a.m., 12, like right at noon, oh, yeah. like that time frame. None of them were at night and none of them were like real early or real late. And so I was like, oh, they're bedding like right, they got to be bedding right here. And I tried to hunt that spot a couple times and I just could never get in there clean enough because what I would, I was going in way before daylight and I was getting up in the tree like an hour before daylight. Yeah. And then what was happening was those, those does were coming in on top of me and like my ther- they would get my thermals at some point, and I just couldn't stay in there clean that long. Yeah. And so I'd get busted, and you know I never killed anything there. Yeah. I only hunted a couple times, but that's what I saw on that camera. And I was like, man, these deer are like in there. I'm like, I'm on the money, you know. I'm on their spot, you know. And it was just this little secure area, but I never really figured out how to hunt it. So it's just one of those spots, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe going but, in, but going in after daylight, just slipping in whatever cut a trail through the pines because i was also They're, coming up through the smz's no coming no, up no, the no, bottom no 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 no, no. <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to be seen i want to i want to I wanna jack them <laughs> oh well what i was saying go back i want to talk about cameras so two years ago i killed the biggest deer ever killed when i was using cell cameras I had him from the time, you know, first cracked velvet, had him on camera the whole time. Well, if it wouldn't have been for cellular cameras, Mm -hmm. I would have busted him out of the stand I was hunting a hundred times. I had pulled up to the gate and sat at the gate for two hours before I went, like, pulled up an hour before daylight, checked my phone. I'm like, okay, he's in there. Sat there, checked it. He's in there. You got a picture of him that morning. Oh, I, I, like I'm sitting there every five minutes. I'm re, re, refreshing the camera, checking it, and he's in there. He's in there. He's in there. He's not mm. leaving. He leaves, and it's it's eight thirty, you know, in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I'll refresh it, and I'll wait about thirty minutes to where the does, everything, they're all gone. They leave. Well, I've had him on camera for the past three months. At you know, ten thirty to two o'clock. So I'll sit there, sit there. You know, my dad will text me, call me, I'm like, "Well, have you seen anything?" I'm like, no, "I'm still sitting in the truck." He's like, "What do you mean?" He's just, I'm like, "He's you know, I've been out there for four hours from four. You know, the time I got there before daylight, sitting there. I'm like, I can't get in the stand. Once everything clears out for about thirty minutes." Is when I'll try to slip down in there, then I'll get in. And but I've also we've ran the cell cameras. I've only killed one big deer off of trail cam picks that I have patterned. We've ran cameras for years. I've patterned them. I'm like, okay, they're here, there, but I've only killed one deer. I say I've only killed one deer on camera. I've only killed one, what I consider a big deer, off a of camera. That's what I want to talk about the cameras. Pattern big deer here and there in Alabama because I have had a lot of big deer on camera. They're there, they're there, and they're gone. Yep. Never get another picture. Yep. I've only killed one, what I consider a trophy, on camera that I have actually patterned. I don't. That's why I don't rely on pictures. Well, see, that, that's that, that's that deer right there. That's yeah. why I wanted to talk about it because yeah. I've had a lot of bigger deer on camera mm-hmm. than that deer I killed that year. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's pattern, pattern, pattern. They're gone. Yeah, it's like yeah. a couple day period. So this deer right here, the wizard, which listeners or, or the viewers can't necessarily see, but Andrew can maybe cut. Yeah, it I'll, I'll cut in some pictures. So, of them. The, so the wizard buck, maybe this, a trail. This is the video. one that our buddy Michael Pike was hunting. Um, and he had that deer on camera a decent amount in different spots in different locations. Yep. And where he was hunting the deer, Scott, you killed him like a mile from there. Yeah. Like, it, like he was hunting where the deer had been. Yeah. He's there a little bit, but he's not there all the time. And you were on a, a, on a travel corridor where the does are there and he was coming through and that's I'll, where you kind of killed him. I want to go back to mm-hmm. what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So just go, go ahead. Yeah, but, but it's just interesting. It's getting like, 
that that's the one thing that we always take this take it with a grain of salt. Like we the, the you can't one, yeah yeah you can't you can't put all your stock in yeah. that. You cannot do that. The only guy I Mark, know – Mark did it this year, and I'm just like, damn, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, trail cameras, tra- trail cameras are a are invaluable on some yeah, information you yeah. get. But if you get too much in the weeds of it, it can really dictate where you hunt and how It'll you hunt. It'll take you somewhere you don't need to be. Absolutely. Yeah. So the only person I know in the southeast that we've interviewed that's had tremendous success with trail cameras, and he was so good with it, killing huge deer in Mississippi, he stopped using them because it wasn't funny anymore. He killed like a 200-inch deer doing yeah. it, and he's killed a bunch of other, like, think, was it you, 70 bucks over 140 inches he's killed? Yeah. Uh, or maybe it's, it's, 40. it's it's something crazy, crazy high. But Travis Murray, he's been on the podcast a few times. He's yeah. from Mississippi. Most he, of the time, you have to have a lot of acreage to be able to pattern them and hold them, yeah. though, as well. As, well, yeah, you have to have a, a lot of cameras or, or strategic cameras. But yeah. yeah, but where I was going, so Travis has had a lot of success or had a lot of success with trail cameras and his trail cam strategy. We had him on a podcast. We can probably look it up. It's, what, it's called Trolling for Monster Bucks with Travis Murray. Yeah, and, I don't know the episode number, but if you look that up, you'll you will find it. And mm-hmm. but he was so successful that he stopped doing it because it wasn't fun. It's like he knew everything about this deer, how the deer was using the area. I he'd wish go I and had kill that it. problem. And he's, he's <laughs> been uh, true. But it's yeah. he's the only guy I've met that had that kind of success with trail cameras. Where other guys, kind of like what we're all saying, is they're awesome because you can learn a lot of stuff. Especially if you leave them out all season, you can kind of figure out like rut patterns and stuff, yep. like when a buck's coming through an area. But it's like if you're using that data, if it's not cell camera, cell camera's a little bit different because we use that. We had some success using cell cameras this year. But yeah. if you're using a regular trail camera, you you can't. It's so hard to use that data this year unless you're checking oh, yeah. it like crazy, which we've had guests on the podcast who yeah. check the camera every three to four days. Well, I mean, the, the cell cameras, mm-hmm. they have helped me out tremendously. But at the same time, you can pattern the deer, but you never know what he's going to do. I mean, regardless, I mean, he can change up. When it, all it takes is one random person because like our property where I had him was right off the river. There's a lot of duck hunters. Mm-hmm. I could tell when duck hunters were in there because he wouldn't be on camera. I mean, where I had him from where I had him on camera to the river is 60 yards. When the duck hunters were in there, he wouldn't be on camera that day. And that's cuz they're right there and where he was from when he was leaving the camera where he was headed was towards the river. There's a big thicket up against the edge of the river. When the duck hunters are coming in there hunting, he he's off this way. I hell, I got him one day. He was fifteen hundred yards from where I never had him on camera there before. And I think it was open day of duck season. He was pattern, 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 pattern. Open day of duck season. He's fifteen hundred yards. You know, on a different camera. Never had him before. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that little bit of pressure, and he's gone. So yep. that you know that feeds back into the where we get into the where they get pressure on them. You know that opening. If you can just get in there when nobody else is diving in there, that opening day. Yep. It's it's that it's it, and it you you've got a window there with these most mature bucks that will get killed by chance, you know, mm. when they will not get killed until the rut starts. It's it's that it's that it's that little bit of pressure thing, man, that's just it, it's 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 priceless. Mm-hmm. You know, Go to the mature buck thing. We had a six point. He was eight and a half years old when he got killed. He was a six point that's all he ever was. He just got wider and bigger. But when he got killed, he was 22 and a half inches wide. His longest time was an inch and a half. We had him on camera for eight and a half years. It was right before dark, like in the morning, right before daylight, in the afternoon, right at dark. He got killed a mile, exactly a mile from where we had him on camera. I saw that deer. I can't confirm I saw him. We had a lane cut through the pines, and he would cross in the mornings right before daylight, 
he had his pattern. We had a camera. We'd get him on camera. But it was he was like 200 yards to the end of the lane. He would cross. He would stop. And it was like, I know that's that deer, but I'm not going to take the shot because I can't con- – it's so dark mm-hmm. that I can see times. I know it's him, but I don't know it's him. And he was eight and a half years old when he got killed. And it was a mile right down the road. Dude shot him sitting on his back porch. Now, <laughs> so uh, another, another thing with trail cameras, I mean, this is why we're talking about trail cameras. It seems like, and Scott, maybe we can, this would be an interesting discussion for you. So many people have put a crutch on trail cameras for not having woodsmanship and scouting skills. Um, and it seems cause I've got guys, I have personally talked to guys that like all they do on a property, especially private property, they just put trail cameras out. They don't scout the private property. They just put trail cameras out and they just rely hundred percent on what the trail cameras tell them about how they hunt something. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're missing like, say like in that situation, like you got a deer coming, you know, right after day or, you know, right after dark or right before daylight in the spot, but they're never like trying to backtrack the deer or try to move around. And what in an example, if you, if you use trail cameras and you still focus on woodsmanship skills, to me, those are the, some of the most successful hunters I've seen that are using trail cameras. It's like you have the woodsmanship skills. You're trying to figure out how those deer are like using that terrain, using the property, how they're coming through an area. And like some of the guys we've talked to on the podcast, slowly move those cameras back in the direction that deer is coming from, specifically, especially in the evenings, and, and try to pattern that from that perspective. But it's like, I mean, trail cameras are fun. I call it like trail cam porn because it's like, dude, yeah. you get a photo of a big buck. It is, it's it awesome. Porn. It's yeah, awesome. It's porn. That's great. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Before you take off, so where we, where that deer <laughs> yeah. was crossing, mm-hmm. so where he was going and where he came from was, it was all cut over. What he came from or what he was coming from was so thick, I had to get on my hands and knees to crawl through it. Yeah. And there was like one trail – and then where he was going was the same same thing, and it was, I mean, it was as thick as far as you want to go. It came from cow pasture on this side and cow pasture on the end of the thicket. So I had stands in both ends of, you know, I mean, it was a dirt trail wore down the mud. He wasn't the only one using it. But – I never caught him in either pasture, Mm -hmm. had cameras, and he was branching off somewhere and going this way or that way, wherever he was going. But I knew where he was coming from, and I knew where he was going, but I didn't know exactly where and where he was coming from. I mean, it came from main road. You got main road, cow pasture, thicket, bottom, the bottom pasture, river. And he – Somewhere he was branching off this way, that way, through there. That's called not time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's called an unkillable deer, probably. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's a reason he lived eight and a half years old. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And again, it's interesting because you hear stories like that all the time, like guys talking about like nocturnal bucks. But Scott, kind of going back, you know, we talked about kind of like that mid morning movement. How long in early season will you sit in a stand? If you're getting in there just right after daylight, right after gray light, you know, you're getting the stand, you can see good. When do you know, like, hey, I need to get down and get out of here? I mean, are you sitting all day or are you, like, sitting until noon? What do you typically try to do? Uh, let the day tell you what it's going to, you know. You know, I mean, you you know, you, you got deer come in at 9, you know. You know, you don't want to get it down. Just let the day tell you. It, there's no – rhyme or reason you know um shoot sit all that i mean <clears throat> you know it, it's funny we talk about hunting feed trees which are the best at dark at dark i mean it's given all right but me hunting these sites uh so many times i will sit till one o'clock and then i'll go home you know i i I don't know you know if there's any rhyme or reason to that but Mm -hmm. i i I, i've I've, there's a rhyme there's a reason 
I've killed <laughs> yeah, all the deer around us. I've, yeah. ki- I've killed. I killed one good buck out there in the afternoon with a gun. One, I mean, I've killed a bunch of deer out there in the evening, but um, <clears throat> um, as far as my my hunting day, I mean, I'll go get in there and I'll sit till one one thirty, two o'clock. I'll get down and go home. You know, that's my. That's my hunting day. That's does that does that make? Oh yeah, that's when most people are going to get in the woods. Yeah, if yeah, it, 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 yeah, probably not even that early I mean, season. Those yeah. guys like they're trying to sleep yeah. in at three thirty. Exactly, yeah. three, four, three, four, o'clock. four o'clock. It's like man, it's hot. No, no, I'm gonna no, get in here. No, those deer. I mean, mid midday's midday's crucial. You know, mm-hmm. even when it's hot and it sucks and you're up there, but it it, it is. I mean. Those deer will just pop out, and you'll be like, "Holy crap!" You know how how can this be? Well, yeah, it's mm-hmm. about to go down. You know, I saw I was about talking about the cameras mm-hmm. when I couldn't get in there in the mornings because the deer. It was the same thing. Like first month, you know, bow season. I I couldn't get in there. I had to get in there at twelve o'clock, or I wasn't going to get in the stand because it didn't matter if it was the shooter that was coming in there but i'd have other small bucks or something i mean they were in there 12 o'clock you you had to be in the stand before that or you weren't gonna get in there but from 12 to date to dark it was in and out in and out those bucks there i mean there was no getting in there mm-hmm. and it was that was every single day you private hunting folks <laughs> this was just me and my dad that's on the river there was a bunch of poaching going on i guarantee you i promise you that <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just private a lot of them deer that that i saw that i had never seen before that's because somebody was down there on the river trying to get off a boat to come in to kill <laughs> they was getting run up <laughs> oh when man I, when i go to the processor and i go Man, I, that, that dude looks familiar. I've, I've, I've <laughs> seen that, you know, that two and a half year old. Where, where'd you kill that? Oh, I killed him, uh, you know, over the mountain. I'm like, <laughs> that was at four, four forty five this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, that, that's that's the same deer. No, man. No. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, yeah, it's. A part of me wonders where the where the you know leave out morning hunting in early season kind of came from because that's something I didn't really hear growing up down here at least when I started consuming deer hunting media like when I was a teenager and I was reading magazines reading articles or whatever watching TV shows and they're like you know that that's when I heard that's when I first heard about don't hunt early season in the mornings and the October law I'd never heard about the October law before bullshit. <laughs> uh, when, when i grew up hunting it was you go in you come out at 10 yeah i mean that, oh, yeah. that was Same. it that was all and, you know at 10 o'clock everybody's back at the clubhouse yeah That's yeah and it's just like an unspoken rule yeah nah, you're t- you're there you're there at at 10 a.m 10, a, 10, you're o'clock, at 10, 10 a.m 10 o'clock it's fixing to get real and, I yeah. mean, I'm telling from you. now i would rather go in at eight o'clock and hunt till two o'clock mm-hmm. then go in at daylight and hunt you know, till 10, 11. Part of me wonders if that, a lot of that stuff, I feel like, came from the Midwest. A lot of the guys writing those articles are from Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, They're, they're hunting Wisconsin. big ag. They're hunting big ag. They're hunting wood blocks. And the deer, they oh, are. They, yep. They're they, getting they, back to the, that, the only 10 acres that they have to bed say, in that, well, that, before that, daylight. That, that, that takes us back to where, there. that takes us back to where, you know, they're eating acorns. You're going into their feed place. It's the same thing. Yeah. You know, you, you just let them, let them do their thing. Let them go back, lay back down, go in there, right at daylight, you know, let them come back in at 10 o'clock. It's, 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 it's y'all, y'all have seen more than I've seen in, in, in the ag fields up there. It's just like, don't even hunt in the morning. You can't. There's no way. Yeah. 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 There's no way. Yeah. Because you're going to yeah. blow deer out because yeah. they're in the so, ag fields. So it's, 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 it's somewhere along the same lines, but it's, it's sketchy. There's, there's, there's no written rule. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you you got to go in there, slip in there. If you can get in there without blowing them out, mm-hmm. you're you're good. Yeah. You know? And I wonder how much of that also has to do with, and this is kind of where I was getting at with that, how much of it is up there they don't have just vast amounts of bedding cover like we have down here. Every oh, ridge geez, top, every ridge top everywhere, is a bedding it's everywhere. They can bed anywhere they want, yeah. and it's a lot messier. So it's like the deer, maybe they're just not – they don't have to go get back in that 10-acre thicket, you know, in the middle of 400 acres of soybeans – to be safe, you know, they can kind of drift around and kind of do whatever so, they want because they're never more than 100 yards from a thick edge, yeah. right? So th- th- I, I I firmly believe, like, and I think a lot of the Southerners, you know, read that content, specifically reading those or read those articles about not hunting mornings in early season and the October low, low and all that. Like Andrew said from the Midwest guys, because, like, when you hunt stuff like that, and you're hunting a lot of ag, and I've hunted ag in a couple different states now. Those deer have so so much less cover. It is like you know where they're going to bed because there is one option. There's one option only. Yeah, they're in the like like if, when I was in Iowa, they're in the CRP only. They're not in the timber because timber is wide open. They're in the CRP, and they're feeding. The, they're they're not feeding on oaks. They're they're feeding in the bean fields. They're feeding in the corn. And it's like if that's the case, like yeah, you've got to hunt evenings because if you hunt in the mornings, even if like you're trying to slip in after daylight, let all those deer trickle out. Like you're probably gonna find deer browsing back in that timber or back in that CRP. They're probably not gonna come back out in the in the wide open in the the hot sun mid morning versus where we're at. It's heavily timbered. There's shade, nice cool breeze. Even though it's gonna be hot, there's a cool breeze for them, and they can kind of feed around in that shade. And it's 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 apples to oranges comparison. And that's why like yeah. content like this and episodes like this to me is so important from like a southerner's perspective listening to this because this isn't. We're not talking about Midwestern hunting, where they're, again they're hunting afternoons only all the way up through you know October thirtieth, and yeah. then they're like, okay, now we're gonna hunt mornings. Like I see so many guys on social media talk about like, man, I don't hunt mornings till October 29th or October thirtieth, and I'm like, I get it for where you're at, especially if you're hunting more ag country, but like down here, like seeing the the success Scott you've had, and talking to some other guys, especially in river bottom stuff, it's like you know you can have success at different points of the day, and like you don't just have to hunt the evenings. But I feel like it's been drilled home so yeah. much with so many people for the last 30 years that, like, everybody thinks you can only have success in early season in the afternoons. No. Yeah. No, I mean, <clears throat> at, afternoons on a feed tree will I, – I, and it even tasks me to say it will always be king. But feed trees at 10, 11 o'clock will – Oh man, anything can happen. Mm-hmm. Anything can happen. It really, I mean, it just, it just, it's early season bow hunting. I've had it. It's it's throw it up this way or this way. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's really like I've I've had some seasons early morning bow season. Mm-hmm. It's early morning. You're there. The deer are there. That's it. I've had bow seasons where. Early morning, you're not going to see a damn thing. You get to mid-morning, that's when your deer are going to start moving. It, And I'm hunting the same place year after year, and it's it, it's like take a, a coin and flip it. Mm-hmm. And I'm hunting the same place, acre and crop's still good, water's still there. It's just kind of a uh, it, – it, which – I don't know how to explain. It's weird. It's, it's it's basically like flip a coin year to year. Which if you need to hunt first thing in the morning or middle morning, man, that's a heavy pour, Scott. <laughs> it, it's a toss up, and it it which where where I normally hunt it. Y'all gotta watch the video. Sorry, <laughs> get get gunk it, it, It's hard to pattern those deer, even. <laughs> even on camera, because yeah. it's I mean it changes year to year. It, and well, I'm I'm literally the cameras in the same tree, mm-hmm. same you know year after year, one year, first thing in the morning you 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 got to be there for daylight. They're gonna be there, you know, eight o'clock. We're the gonna next, the next year, we're going to get to you back on the management area. The ne- no, but, we'll get you back on the pole where you can run, bro. Yeah, but you ain't limited to boundaries because you got a, well, you're limited to boundaries. But it's, 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 you, know, it's, 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 you got tens of thousands. You got tens of thousands of acres versus like but, a couple hundred or a thousand. But, but it's, it's like one year, 
eight o'clock, the deer of the year. The deer yeah. are there. You you need to be there the mm-hmm. next the next year. Same cameras on the same tree. Yep. S- hitting in the same stand. They're not gonna be there till ten eleven o'clock. And no, I mean, as far as I know, nothing's changed. It's mm-hmm. the acre crop's still good. Water's still there. It it it's like flip a coin. Yeah. Wh- which way you want to go? And Scott, that's what Cody was saying is a good point that I want to bring with you is. How do you deal with good versus bad acorn crop years? And like, because like last year it was pretty rough. Yeah, man, it's you know that's uh, that's 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 when you got to figure out you know you you got to be a food source hunter. You know, um, you if 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 by chance there's you know. There, there's not a good crop well then you got to figure out okay it's food source what what are you what are you going to key on honeysuckle green briar browse you know we don't we don't have uh, we don't have green fields to hunt you know mm-hmm. um that takes me kind of back to where what these acorn crops mean to these deer Mm-hmm. It's it's man, it's vital. Yeah, you know. Um, so therefore, when when it gets rough in in the, in the acorn woods, you know, then I start looking at 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 honeysuckle. You know, honeysuckle is it, it carries it carries a lot of these deer. You know, um, is that any kind of browse? It seems like you're trying to focus on those hard years. Um, now another question I've got to ask. And this is what I thought about. How do you take? This is a multi-question question, question uh, but I'm going to ask you the first part of it. How do you take wind in consideration of how you want to set up to hunt these feed trees? Like, what kind of wind do you want? Do you want the wind coming right down the SMZ towards you? Do you want it coming across the SMZ? Because you think the reason why I say all this because a lot of these SMZs, you know, you have some that are more gentle; they're not as steep, and others are very steep. The wind's gonna swirl in some of these situations. Yeah, some like, of it'll roll. It'll roll. So, how those. do you take all that into consideration? Um, uh, dang, Jacob, you just gotta, uh, you know, you gotta hope that there's a constant. Um, you know, that's that's a tough question because that's when a lot of things get complicated. Um, you know, if 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 you're in a if you're in a deep drain like that sometimes it'll roll but i will say this i've had when you're in a deep drain like that and it does roll uh the the deer will get they'll get to where they blow but then all of a sudden they still come in you know Mm. it's it's like they want to be there that bad they want to be there that bad but but then the wind rolls, but then all of a sudden they're like, well, I don't know which I'll, way that was coming from anyway. That's you, a good you, point. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It, 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 it all changes. So you can't, there is no concrete. It's just like, whoa, okay, well, things are bad right now. Well, things may not be bad, you know, in 30 minutes. Yeah. So – let me okay so let me ask you this as well in addition to the wind do you ever notice when you have a bachelor group of bucks coming into a feed tree are they coming in with the wind in their face are they coming in with the wind in their back or does it even matter most of the time they don't even care it doesn't, that, that, doesn't that, that takes me back to where it's just like what the hell is that, <laughs> that's that's those bucks doing that you know it's surprising because they're just like it's it, it just a wrecking crew all of a sudden. It's just like, oh, well, okay. I see horns, you know, and then there's four of them. And you're just like, holy crap, you know. Why why wouldn't they be more subtle than that? You know, you, <laughs> you, you think. Uh, you know. And you think a lot of that has to play into the factor that they haven't it's, been pressured. It's, it's, it's early. Yeah, they it's haven't early. been pressured. Yeah, yeah. So they're not really caring about a scenting advantage coming they to the spot. Yeah. No, they don't. They don't they, there is not one dam that's given. You tell yeah. my deer coming in upwind instead of downwind? Yeah. Yeah. One of the best hunts I've ever had early season, I screwed up. It was a, 
a very big non-typical, like what you're talking about, you know, had, you know, bases <coughs> about like that, co- that, that beer can right there. Mm-hmm. Um, now he, that was probably three, the th- third, second to third week of season in, ten- in Tennessee, uh, hunting in, hunting in a thicket that, uh, with a creek coming through, there were some feed trees there that were further down the creek and I was hunting more bedding. Nope. Assuming I hadn't even been to the spot. I just, I was going off the maps, going off, uh, on X and, you know, had like an old fence road in the timber that you can see on the map. And I'm like, man, I bet you they're going to run that fence line. They're probably going to feed. It looks like there's oaks on the aerial imagery. It looks like there's oaks on one side of the creek. It looks like there's thick bedding on the other side of the creek. I'm going to get right down there on the creek up against that fence and see if I can catch deer coming from those oaks back across. And 9.30 in the morning, freaking monster come by me while I'm jacking Nine. around on my phone. 9.30. 9.30. <laughs> yep. And it goes into another question. It was cold front, cool or cool front had happened. Actually, it was cold front. It get down in the 30s that morning. It was October, I think, the 7th or 8th. And uh, it was it was a cold front came through. Yeah, and sure uh, in Alabama. Oh yeah, but but it was <laughs> it was uh, crazy. I'm on my phone jacking around like I had a couple young bucks come by. And, you know, deer that I probably would have shot if I had already shot a, a younger buck early in the season, like uh, two weeks before. And I shot like a I think I shot a spike or something. Yeah, you shot a dink, man. Uh, off the, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> shot. Sh- sh- it was the it's the uh, it's the second deer I've ever shot on the ground with my bow, and it was on that film. It. Oh yeah, it's on our YouTube channel. It's on the YouTube channel. I, sm- <laughs> I forgot about that. It's on the YouTube channel. Smoke this spike, dude. He didn't know what happened. Okay, he's he's bobbing his head at the me. face he made after he shot that deer. He's like. <laughs> like, oh, oh, you yeah. gotta go watch the video. Dude, I for, it's on YouTube. I smoked. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so so I had one, it's one. You got one tag left, and I'm like, these two nice eight points come by. You know, th- two two and a half year old bucks. This nice, you know, rack bucks come by 15 yards, and they're feeding underneath me. I was come to find out I climbed an oak in the in the dark, which I knew it was. I didn't know there's acorns on the ground. They're feeding around me, kind of went down the creek, and at like 8 30, 9 o'clock, I'm playing around my phone. I'm like, man, ain't nothing gonna happen. And I happen to look up since nine o'clock. I look up. And there's this giant. He's walking right to left, 25 yards in front of me through my one shooting lane that kind of comes off the creek towards that thicket. And uh, he, he's by the time I look up, he's halfway across that opening. The opening's about 10 yards wide. I'm like, oh crap! So I'm trying to cut the camera on. Don't even cut the camera on in time. Trying to grab my bow. I said, forget the camera. Grab my bow. I'm just gonna yeah, shoot. We'll take, put take, that photos shit out the <laughs> we'll take photos later. We'll take photos later. And dude, by the time I get my bow, he's like out of that shooting lane, and now his butt is facing me at 30 yards, walking directly down that fence row. Going back up on this little ridge top to go bed. I'm like, son of a gun. Now I hunted the next, I hunted that evening, didn't see him. Hunted the next morning, didn't see him. And, uh, you know, but but again, you know, it's kind of later morning hunting, early season, where most guys, like, I'm going to hunt the afternoons, but I'm like, cold front's coming. We ought to catch him coming, slipping back to bed a little bit later in the afternoon. And I saw a bunch of deer. I think I saw 15 deer that morning. A uh, bunch of does came by. Uh, it was two little bucks and that, that giant. And I'm like, son of a gun, dude. She learned a valuable lesson. Get up. Quit Lock playing your on up. your phone, man. Yeah. Lock your phone the up, The phone is the worst end to put a child dude, lock on. I, 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 I will go out on a limb and say this. I think smartphones have saved more bucks' lives <laughs> than <laughs> anything else ever developed or ever brought to the market. 100%. Yep. yep. <laughs> the biggest deer I've ever hey, killed, Yeah. I was my fiance <laughs> at the time, wife now. It was Christmas Eve. We were supposed to already have left. To go spend time with her family. She texts me. It's like 9.30. She's like, when are you coming out? I was like, ah, you know. I, I hadn't seen the deer since like 7, 7.15. I was like, text her back. I'm like, I'm coming down. I hadn't seen nothing. I'm over there throwing stuff in my backpack. Like, not being quiet. Mm-hmm. Just, I'm out of here. She texts me. She's like, are you coming out now? I'm going to start packing bags. I was like, yeah, I'm coming. Look up. All I see is rack in the field. I'm like, uh, and then didn't even send the text. Just dropped it in the floor. The biggest deer ever killed. But if she wouldn't have texted me, I'd have probably been sitting there playing some game or something because yeah. I'm like, I ain't seen a deer in two, and a, two hours, Absolutely. almost three hours, like, you know, I'll look up every five, ten minutes like, yeah, and, 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 nothing's changed. And, it's, like, and it's like you can almost do that on a food plot because maybe the deer is going to come through and feed. But, like, if you're in the timber, you can't be on your phone. No. If, you're on, if you're on a creek and there's you can't hear, because that's another thing about that spot. It was like a – it was a light, kind of like a gurgling creek, as oh. in, like, there's little shoals behind me. It's like, I mean, do you want to go to sleep? I mean, I it was say, that sounds beautiful. Like that, that's th- and, and I'm like – 
I couldn't, so I could not hear deer walking. Like the only time I saw a deer, or only time I knew there was a deer there, I visually saw them. But you could not hear them walking because that creek. And we talked to, we interviewed Bobby Worthington like later that year, yep. or whatever. And he's like, he's like, dude, he's like, you, he's like, you put that phone down. You don't. <laughs> he's like, if you're hunting a buck and you're going to go kill a big buck, the last thing on your, you should put the phone at the bottom of your backpack, lock it up, whatever. Like that phone does not come back out until nope. you're leaving that tree. You don't want it. And dude, it it takes everything inside of me, dude. It's like not touch the phone. Because like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't take but that. They're dude, there and gone. Arkansas this year. This is another funny story. Uh, then we'll get back to this. Um, Arkansas this past year, I was hunting. I was hunting a, a strip of timber going between some CRP fields, and it's a bunch of water oaks. And this is in November, and dude, there was they were feed. You they were feeding under these water. These waters were getting hammered. I wasn't even really hunting. Those water oaks are good. Uh, yeah, when you get the yeah. good ones, and they're like yep. <laughs> yeah, I was say, that, 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 that's Scott's secret that no way yeah. no, we haven't even talked about yet. But the, um, anyways, I was playing on my phone, dude, and I'm like, I had my phone up to like my side of sitting in the saddle, and all of a sudden, I like, gl- I catch movement, like just off the left side of my phone, I look down, and there's a doe 25 yards from me, and I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like trying to slip my phone down, I'm looking for a buck because it's the rut. I'm looking for, I'm like, where's the buck? Where's the buck? Where's the buck? There's no buck, and there's three does. And I'm like, oh crap. So I'm like slipping it down my jacket pocket, and I'm like trying to like, you know, chill out and like trying to get in the shadow of this tree and all this kind of stuff. But uh, that was there. I was going to say another, another interesting thing. So, smartphones definitely have saved a lot of bucks. Another thing that saved a ton of bucks, I'm going to tell you right now because it definitely, it cost me some is a summit climber in those seats more guys have fallen asleep in a summit climber <laughs> oh. than any other tree scene i think ever invented period oh, oh, man. I, i'll agree with that you you get the strap set just right oh, dude. The, the front ones are up a little bit falling in the back ones you, you, get, you get like this and it's like uh, dude, it, it, it gets about seven thirty in the morning. Like, dude, that sun hits you. Like, yeah. oh, dude, it's cold. December what, day. Yeah. Oh, dude, when it's when it's about forty forty five, <laughs> and the sun's hitting you straight in the face. So Finally, that sun hits you. You're like, oh, uh, you're, you're, <laughs> you're done. You're, you're feeling about sixty five degrees when the sun's hitting you. <laughs> Ow, dude, oh. I'm t- save more big oh. bucks. I'm telling you, dude. dude yeah. Right after you finished your so, last honey bun, and, and see, that, uh, that, that, to be like the Co- cosmic brown. To be oh, cosmic brown. <laughs> Classic. To be a hundred percent honest, that's one reason I have, and it's funny enough because everybody's like, "I want a comfortable climb. I want a comfortable climb." I'm like, "Dude, I'm in the woods. I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be uncomfortable to the point where I have to focus on stuff. Because if I'm too comfortable, I'm going to go to sleep." One hundred percent. That's why my climber now. I have a the old old school lone wolf sit and climb, which they don't even make anymore, with a mesh seat, a Hasmore seat. It's it's. It's okay. It's not like a summit yeah, seat. Like it, yeah. you ain't get you're, you're, sit, comfortable. you're sitting up high. It doesn't hurt to sit. It does, on, doesn't but it's hurt. Not comfortable. It yeah. doesn't hurt, but it doesn't like wrap around you. So like when you sit up real high, and if you fall asleep, you're falling out of the stand. Yeah. Like you got to shake your arms on, but there's nothing like you sit up really high in that stand. Yeah. Also, same thing with the saddle. Like I can't fall asleep in a saddle unless no. I am I'm beyond but tired. You and but then also you can if you cinch it up right yeah. and get close enough to a tree. You can go to sleep. I promise. Yeah, I've you. slept in a saddle before. But I ain't gonna lie. I can't. I, 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 <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. I, I, if I you cinch it up just right, yeah, you, I, I you haven't done sleep. that. And then also uh, a lock on. Like I, I love hunting. I have a mobile lock on because the thing is, I want to be tight to the tree. But I again, I don't want crazy comfort. I don't. Well, see, if no, my butt hurts, great. I'm gonna stand up. I, I'm gonna so be focused. I feel you on that. So I buy the lock yeah. on. I buy a, just a cheap lock on mm-hmm. that's you got a seat that's you know this wide. Yeah. The platform, the platform is big enough to stand on, but you can't get comfortable. Absolutely. So you have to, you know, pay attention. You can't get comfortable if you go to sleep. And that's the thing. It's like, I mean, like with the saddles, I'm saying like saddles aren't uncomfortable. Like they're fine to sit in and, and, and lean in. But I'm saying like. If I, you get the right one, yeah. you're out. But that's I don't want that. I don't want to be that comfortable where I'm going to sleep. Like I want to be, I want to be. Sl- not miserable, but I want to be slightly dis- <laughs> yeah, discomfort yeah, yeah. while I'm in the tree because I'm like, no. if I'm not, I'll start doing other things. But I'm, if I've got to like kind of you know not move around, but I'm like, okay, like I love honey, I have a little lock on. Like I've got some tiny little lock ons. Oh, like, that's dude, what I'm saying. I buy like the cheap. Yeah, like the guys yeah. that run those it's Millennium a- M100s that like the big hammock seat. My brother oh, had one. No. I'm like, do you go sleep in that thing? Like I can't use it. Like I can't use it. Like he's even like that with the podcast. We were picking out chairs for our podcast studio. He's like, these are too comfortable. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> like a wooden chair with a back. It sucks. It's not comfortable at all. He's like, these are too comfortable. We need no. to be sitting up. Your so, back needs to hurt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're doing a podcast. My dad, you know, he he's he's into the old man hunting now. Well, he bought some two man ladder stands. Mm-hmm. It's got like a hammock seat. Ooh. Almost. Yeah. It's got a a swinging 
thing over here, it's got a little platform. It's got a cup holder mm-hmm. and everything. It's got a cup holder in the center. <laughs> I'm like, Dad. He's like, I'm too old to not be comfortable. I'm like, 15 minutes, I'm out. Yeah. Like, I can put my honey buns here, my honey <laughs> buns here. Like, Get give me a zebra cake. Like, yeah. I, I can take a whole club sandwich and cut it up over <laughs> here and eat it. Like, you, All you're this, missing is TV. Exactly. Like, this, <laughs> this is not going to work. Like, if I take my iPad and put a clamp, like, I got a, a, a three-course meal right here in the stand. Like, I can't do it. Oh, and, that's great. And his, his whole thing was – I'm gonna be comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know what? If you're comfortable, hey, that's if it, fine. hey, if it keeps it out, if it keeps you out there longer, exactly. Though, you know, right. like, that that's his thing. Cause he's had four back surgeries. Oh, that's different. He's got four yeah. screws and bolts in his back, and he's like, I gotta be comfortable. I'm like, there's a difference between comfortable and sleeping. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's almost past come like that's almost more comfortable than a recliner Dude, sitting at the house watching tv uh, like, another, i'm out another thing is real bad and just while we're on this little tangent so uh anthony who we just did or one of our last episodes with down at the farm my uncle he's got a bunch of shooting houses down there like that he's built and like I, I took my sister's fiance down to try to get his, his first deer last year, and we struck out. But dude, you know he's got these nice office chairs in there, I, I and I'm like, like every, and, every one of our shooting house has office chairs. And, in but it. dude, they're, they're I mean, you get back in. I'm, uh, I told Anthony, yeah. I'm like, bro, I need something. <laughs> I need something firm. I can't like this is too comfortable. To, and like the, and like dude, you're sitting in that box stand. And like you know, you're kind of building some warmth up in it because you got the, you got one or two windows up. Say, and I'm like, dude, I'm about to go to sleep. You dude. get the this right time. Of, you get the right time of year when it's cold outside, and then you get in there and it gets a little bit of warmth. It's perfect napping weather. It's terrible, dude. Yeah, I'm telling you, <laughs> gone sa- saves so many deer's lives. But um, <laughs> they kind of get off that tangent. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> And see, you're, I, you're, you're, look, you're not used to the shooting house with all this Hell no. <laughs> look, He's I, like, I'm sitting on a rock. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take you. Oh, I'm going hardcore. I'll take you in and, and I'll put you in one of them. I don't have these problems. I, I, I'll put you on them shooting houses that is like a four by eight. You can lay down and just like bring <laughs> yeah. your cot, dude. Just. You got you got you got three office chairs in there. You got a futon in there with you. You, you, got, a, you got, got a mini a, fridge. You got all a, the beer you want. You got a bench sitting in the back where you set everything up. You got gun holders sitting in it. You get packed. You cr- you crack the window. It's a it's a fifty degrees outside with a slight wind. You crack the window, lay back, gone. Yeah. Yeah, I've, t- I've taken it's, some of the best naps in the world in the woods. Say, and it that. was back when I had a summit climber. I'm just going to say it right now. Like, dude, there was one hunt. I was on the management area, and I went out there. This was when I was in college. I had, like, the morning off. I didn't have class like, the afternoon. Hungover? No, no, no. No. no, no. no. It was plenty of sober, unlike tonight. So, no, but I went in there, and I sat on this ridge side. And I'm like, man, it's hardwoods. Kind of like it was – Bow season. It was. It was kind of like right. It was like first week of November before you know gun opener. It was a couple weeks later. I got up in that tree, dude. It wasn't six thirty in the morning. It had been light for thirty minutes. I ain't seen anything. And I'm like, dude, I got so comfortable that some climber. I stretched back. I woke up. It was ten forty five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, dude, I was like drooling. I woke up. And I was like drooling outside my mouth. And I woke up. I'm like, dude, there could have been the biggest buck ever okay. walked by me. Now, Booter walked by. I'm never saying now, Grant. I've never taken that good of a nap. I, I, I'm more of, yeah. I'm more of like a thirty minute, fifteen minute napper in the stand. That that's uh that that may be a record. You you need to you need to you need to file that one in and see if you can get some kind of plaque or something. Cause that that's yeah, but uh, it, it's that's, funny. That's a good one. Well, Scott, real quick, um, because we'll have to wrap up here in a couple minutes. Just kind of getting back to the whole early season topic. What would be some of your like? What would be like if you had to like put all this entire bow around it? Like some like lasting advice for somebody like going into this season, they want to have success early on, specifically in the southeast, maybe Alabama, maybe Georgia, Mississippi, something like that. What? How would you advise them or give them some kind of advice in order to get out there and go find the stuff that we've been talking about? You know, I mean, I, I mean, it's just going to be getting the getting the woods. Um, don't. Don't try to make it something bigger than it really is. Just, just, just go look. You know, look under these. Learn to. I. I mean. I mean. It's. It's. It's almost like you have to. Uh, uh, you know, if you don't know how to hunt, uh, learn how to identify oak trees, white oaks, 
red oaks, water oaks, whatever it may be. Um, get out and just and and just look, learn, try to be. You know, try to turn, try to learn woodsmanship. Um, and there's there's no uh, there's there is no uh, written law that's ever going to be. You know, there's 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 always going to be variables. Um, there's always going to be trees that drop at different times, and there's always going to be this and that. There's always going to be variables. You know. Um, but but get out there and, and give it a go, you know. Um I, mean, I I love that, man. That's a good that's a good note to end it on too, because at the at the end of the day, on most episodes we preach woodsmanship and our guests preach uh woodsmanship. Yeah. Woodsmanship and is is key. Don't man. make it something that it's not. That is like yes. the quote of this yes. podcast. Like go it's it's really kinda simple. And at yeah. the end of the day, you can't really learn it from this pod there's a lot of really good tips in this podcast but at the end of the day you got to go out there and just do it yeah you got to yeah. go just do yeah. it yourself and, and 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 don't make it something bigger than it has to be you know you think uh, just just get out and, and and look you know look at things mm-hmm. take it take it uh and and go look at white oak trees see what they're doing yep. you know it's it, there's nothing more mm-hmm. you know um, like you told me, get your ass out there and walk. Get out there and walk. I mean, I, that, I mean he's been out there that's, with that's me it. now. He's just, he's just like, well, what, what do I need to do? I says, man, and I, I take him to these places, and I said, you know, go through here and walk and look. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of what I've learned on the management area is from him. Because I mean, what I normally hunt, it's kind of like the management area, but it's different. I mean, it's actually kind of really. Before, I mean, most of where I've hunted is up in Gadsden, and it's it's hilly like the management area, but it's it's completely different. And I mean, like he told me, it's like just get your ass out there and walk. You know, you, you, fi- find you you got to find the sign, you got to find the trees, you got to find you know deer are gonna go to food, water, bedding. You find those, put it together. There you are. I mean, and he, I mean, he showed me, he, from what I grew up hunting the management area to what it is now, my perspective has completely changed. I I will hunt the management area completely different from what I used to hunt it. And that's. You got, you got to take that and, and, and run with it. And it's just the way it is, you mm-hmm. know. I think so. There's certain things I'm not gonna say, and you keep them secret. That's hush hush. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's always like that. There's always some cards you gotta hold close to the chest, you know. But I, I'll say this, Scott. I greatly appreciate you letting us come out and do this episode and film it the whole nine yards. Um, it's been an absolute blast. I, I'm excited to get. I think we're gonna have a ton of listener success stories come from this episode. I hope yeah. so, man. I, you know, there, there, there's nothing, there's nothing I can give other than, uh, uh, you know, me being out there and 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 seeing the things that I see. Uh, you know, whatever it may be, but I hope that somebody because it, it, it's even like. Every episode, I listen to y'all's guys. I always pick up something. Just like, I always learn something, you know. So, you know, if somebody can learn something from what my, you know, what I've been able to do, you know, and and stomping around in the woods, you know, great, man. Yeah. Um, you're uh, you're never done learning. If you think you are, then you're no. You you're, you're always you're, never, le- you're always learning, man. Yeah. You're always learning. Uh, uh, and I will continue to learn, you know, SMZ, we're SMZ hunting now. We don't have yeah, these big right. blocks. We don't have these big blocks of hardwoods to hunt anymore. So, but dang, they're still there. Mm-hmm. They're still there. And there's some, there's some damn good deer there. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Listeners, if you've enjoyed this episode, make sure you share it. And also if you have success from this episode, if you go out and kill a buck this, this, this coming fall, Go over to our website, southernoutdoorsman.com, 
and then fill out a listener success form. We'd love to hear about it. And also, if you've had success in the past from other episodes, let us know. But uh, also, appreciate everybody watching this podcast. Again, this podcast is on YouTube. So if you listen to the version, uh, you listen to this podcast, you can go on YouTube and actually watch it, which is kind of fun. Uh, you got you to see me, Andrew, kind of squirming over here trying to ask some <laughs> questions. But um, just yeah, greatly buddy. appreciate everybody watching the podcast, listening to the podcast, share the podcast. And, uh, guys, we'll catch you back here on this uh, Thursday breakdown. Talking about this outro and a lot more. Got a lot of stuff to discuss upon this episode. But, Scott, thank you for letting us come down here. It's been an awesome episode. Welcome anytime.